Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Today, Paul's guest is the Zen teacher or Roshi, Anne Pirocello. Anne is a member of the White Plum Asanga, an affinity group of Zen teachers in the lineage of Haikuyu Taizan Maizumi Roshi. Annie Roshi is originally from the Chicago area and she began practicing meditation and studying philosophy after being exposed to the works of Carl Jung as a teenager. She teaches philosophy in San Diego and Zen practice at the Vista Zen Center. She is also a surf photographer. If you enjoyed today's episode, please consider leaving us a five-star rating and a warm review at the top of the show page on Spotify or at the bottom of the show page if you are listening on Apple Podcast. Your opinions matter and your ratings help us to grow and help more people to be healthy, find freedom of body and mind, and to live their dreams. And now here is Paul talking with Anne about what is Zen? Hello, everybody. Welcome to Living 4D. Today, we're going to talk about a very interesting topic. The title of our show today is What is Zen? And I have Anne Paracello, who is an expert and can answer all our questions about Zen and probably tell us some amazing Zen stories <laughs> and much, much more. So, welcome, Anne. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. I'm really very happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, uh, it was my pleasure. And uh, thank you to Dr. Oliver for suggesting that I consider having you on the podcast because I, I was, I've been wanting to talk to someone that's a Zen Roshi for a long time, but I just haven't found the right person. And here you are. You are the right person. <laughs> well, I hope so. Yeah, I think you are. <laughs> so, and, you know, it must have taken you a fair bit of practice and discipline to reach the level of being a Zen Roshi. I would love it if you can tell us about your life path and what led you to becoming a practitioner of Zen and, and doing all the work to become a Roshi and and, and why you did that. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. I'm not sure I know the answer to that, but oh well, that, at least that, you that, have the answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess I am the answer, but you are the answer. It's, it's my life, but uh, yeah. l- l- let me take a, a, a stab at that. You know, I think maybe the part of my life that where this starts becoming relevant is when I'm about 18 or 19 years old, and um, you know, I was starting to experience real adult problems and starting to be curious about my own psychology and, and so forth. And I started reading Carl Jung. Mm. I think I, I was living in California. I was living near uh, or in Pasadena. And I think I read every single book in the Pasadena library <laughs> uh-huh. by Jung or about Jung, you know, his students, uh, Yolanda Jacoby and Esther She's Harding great. and Marie mm, He's Louise got some Bonfant. amazing, amazing students that write it, amazing books. Incredible. And and a lot of them were and are women. And I think I think that was really important to get that kind of modeling from, yes. from those books. But anyway, um reading Jung, first of all, I got this sense of how vast we are. Mm-hmm. And, you know, looking into myself in a new way. Now, again, mm-hmm. I'm 18, 19 years old. How much did I, un- did I understand? Probably 10%. But it was it's enough, okay. you know, it was enough to, um, to really impress upon me how, how vast and complex uh, we are as human beings. So that, and, and as you know, Jung wrote, he read everything. Yeah. And so he was the doorway for me into Asian wisdom traditions. Mm. Uh, you know, he wrote the foreword to the, to the Wilhelm translation of the I Ching. Yep. I think he mm-hmm. wrote a foreword to um, the secret of the golden flower to some translation of that. And he was just into everything. I mean, what an amazing um, person to encounter as a, you know, as a very young person, um, myself, you know, and, uh, also 
so that, let me back up a little bit. I think that's what got me really interested in Asian traditions. Um, this is where I really first started learning about, you know, traditions of meditation and this, you know, inward turning, turning the light within and so forth. And then also as I, uh, studied philosophy, I was a, you know, I was a philosophy major and one day I started learning about a French philosopher named Simone Weil, and I mm. ended up actually doing a lot of work on her. She was a really interesting, really interesting figure. She I'm lived, not familiar with her. That's unusual. Yeah, <laughs> There's she, not many she, philosophers I haven't studied. She's completely off the beaten path. She lived uh, 1909 to 1943, so she died in the middle of the war. And oh. she she was actually in London when she died because she was working for the Free French, mm. and uh, but she had tuberculosis and and uh, she became very unhealthy and and eventually died. But Simone Weil is a really interesting character. She's sometimes thought of as a as a mystic, and she was of Jewish lineage, but she uh, she became this Christian mystic. Really interesting. She, she was a very well-trained philosopher, very grounded in Plato, but uh, interested in everything. And she read very critically uh, into philosophy from, from all different parts of the world, from all different cultures. And she was also interested in Asian philosophical traditions. And she even looked just a little bit into Zen. I don't think she really understood it. You know, there weren't sources for her. But there, there were a lot of things about Simone Weil and her philosophy that are, that are really resonant with Zen. And one of her main uh, concepts or practices, really, was this notion of attention, paying attention. Mm -hmm. And for her, attention uh, could be practiced sort of on this continuum. You know, on the one hand, like doing school studies, that develops a certain kind of attention. But the very highest form of attention for her is actually prayer. And it's a kind oh, of love. Cool. Yeah, it's, mm -hmm. a, it's, it's, it's love. And um, so Simone Weil got me very interested in uh, philosophy as a very experiential activity. And there was, again, she was so interested in philosophy for, of, of all kinds. So this kind of fed my interest in Asian traditions and also my interest in meditation. So I started meditating when I was, I don't know, 19 or 20. And first I started from a book and then I was able to take a course. I was lucky enough to have a philosophy professor who had formerly been some kind of uh, contemplative uh, monk, maybe Benedictine. Mm -hmm. And he, ta he taught this wonderful class. His name was uh, George Vick. And he taught this class where we would study philosophy, but then for half the period, we would learn different medita meditation techniques. That's and, great. Oh, it was just wonderful. And so I learned to meditate. I learned different techniques through taking that class. And I found that I had a, I, I had the, the temperament to, to sit still, to sit for long periods of time. And I enjoyed it. It was, you know, it becomes like a part of your hygiene. Like you wouldn't think of starting your day without brushing your teeth. Well, I wouldn't mm -hmm. think of going a day without meditating. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. And so then, you know, uh, time went on. I continued my study of philosophy. I got through graduate school. Um, I got a job teaching philosophy. Uh, but eventually, you know, I had been looking for a more formal or organized way to practice meditation. And I tried different retreats and different traditions with different teachers. But eventually, in the early 1990s, or around 1995, I guess, um, I was referred to uh, Nikoli Jikio McMahon Roshi. She was sensei then. 
Mm. But uh, we call her Jikyo Roshi now. And she and I were a great match. Um, in Zen, there's a long history of, you know, Zen practitioners, you know, testing out different teachers and trying to find one that's a good match. Sometimes they would spend years with a teacher before finding that they were not a good match. But it was clear that Jikyo Roshi and I were a very good match. And so I started formal uh, Zen training with her and stayed with her for a long time. Actually received Dharma transmission from her in uh, 2009. Wow, and so I great. Became, became a sensei. And then uh, she empowered me as a, as a Roshi in 2018. And all what Roshi means is just old teacher. <laughs> old right. Teacher. So how many years did it take you to get from starting with her to being a Roshi? I guess it took, it was, as things go, it was fairly quick because I started with her, I think in 95 or 96, and then I became a Roshi in 2018. Well, that's still so, quite a long time. That's 24 years. Yeah. But as I say, as it goes in Zen, that's really not a really long time. It's a long training. That's great, though. A question that came up in me as you were talking is, um, I think it might be helpful for the listeners to hear something from you on what is it that makes a good fit between a, a, mm -hmm. a student and a teacher? Um, of course, we're talking about Zen. So, mm -hmm. like, you know, if somebody's going to go out and say, okay, I want to, you know, I, I listen to this podcast with Anne and Paul, and I really feel inspired to go find a, a Roshi to work with, what, what are they looking for? Oh, it's a really good question. Uh, well, one of the things they're looking for is a person that they can trust, that they feel they can trust. Um, and that may take a while to discover. You know, hopefully before you start working with somebody, you've heard something about this person, you've Talk to other people who've practiced with this teacher. You've done a little research about, you know, this teacher's training and if they're part of a lineage, which is almost always the case in Zen, you know, how is the, the lineage um, regarded and so forth. But then again, on a personal level, again, it can take a while, but if there's some, uh, there's, you know, some fundamental trust and of course mutual respect that's going to be one of the most important things and also you know something that we really emphasize these days because we have seen trouble in all kinds of traditions all kinds of lineages but we want to make sure or you know a, a person looking for a teacher wants to make sure that the teacher a teacher that they work with is respecting appropriate boundaries. Okay. So, uh, you know, in Zen, we've had trouble with teachers developing romantic relationships with their students or taking advantage of them financially, for example, or, uh, in other ways, sort of, um, you know, taking advantage of, uh, the student, because what mm -hmm. often happens in the teacher-student relationship is that the, the teacher will get elevated, you know, and sometimes students come in and they're a little bit starry-eyed and they don't see all the, you know, the usual faults and problems that every human being has, you know, because they, they've elevated and created a, a story around this teacher. So, you know, your original question was, you know, what does it mean to, to find a good match? Right. And it's basically you're looking for a healthy relationship just as you look for healthy relationships with, you know, any other person. But you're looking in to make sure the person has the right kind of training, has the right authorization to be teaching. There, you know, there are people out there who are teaching, teaching Zen or teaching other things who aren't part of a lineage and they may have very deep understanding. I, you know, I don't doubt that some of them do, but the beauty of being part of a lineage 
is that you have you have Dharma brothers and sisters, and you have a teacher. Hopefully, you know your teacher will still be alive, um, and these people help you to to continue to grow, and they can mirror back to you, the teacher, um, any sort of problems or stuck places that you have. You have people to consult. Maybe mm-hmm. when you have a, 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 an unusual student or uh, a problem that comes up in the, in the teaching situation. So a person who's part of a lineage has some really great resources. And, you know, why should we think we can do it all ourselves when there are so many people who are, you know, fabulous uh, resources and have so much experience and so much wisdom to share? One of the things I, I think might be good for the listeners to hear, you know, most people's vision of Zen, unless they have, you know, experience of otherwise, is mm-hmm. a room of people sitting meditating mm-hmm. and not much else happening. When when you're talking about the teachings, it sounds to me like there's a lot more going on than meditating, like you're getting into maybe some philosophy or issues of life or how to handle certain things. So could you tell us a little bit more about what, what it actually happens in a, do you call them dojo? Is it referred to as a dojo? We call it the Zendo or, or you know, the, just the Zen practice center. There are different kinds of practice centers, but it, it can be in a monastery or, but I think what you, what, you like to hear about is actually what happens in the Doksan room. And the What's Doksan, that? that's the room where where teacher and student have a one-on-one uh, uh, encounter. I see. Okay. But let me back up a little bit because you know you're right. Sitting meditation and sitting together uh, in the meditation room or uh, whatever the room is called where one is practicing. That's that's a part. That's a that's a very Im- important part of Zen practice, but it's not the only part at all. You know, there there there's so much more that goes on. Now, one of the things that goes on, one of the things that's really central in Zen training, is the teacher student relationship. And a teacher and student are, are encountering one another in all kinds of ways, especially if you do, you know, extended retreats, intensive uh, meditation events, and so on. There are, there, there are many occasions or many opportunities for a teacher and student to, you know, to, to live together and to encounter one another. But mm-hmm. one of the most important places is what's called the Doksan room. And this is the room of private interview. So there's one-on-one contact of teacher and student. And How basically, often does that happen? Well, it depends. Uh, during retreat, and, you know, we do, the way I was trained, we had, you know, four to six week-long uh, meditation treat, retreats, uh, over the course of a year, and then many, many, many one-day retreats. But during those uh, week-long retreats or session, uh, we might meet with the teacher uh, at least twice a day, sometimes three times a day in private. And this is really important because this is where a teacher and student get to talk about you know, the particular practices that the student is, uh, is using. Uh, this is where if a student is working on a uh, koan, which is something that I think you and I will talk about a little bit later. Yeah, if, I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. If a student is working on koan, this is the, the opportunity for the student to demonstrate their understanding of the koan. And, you know, they can't move on to the next koan. Uh, until the student approves their understanding. You mean till the till the Roshi approves it, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, or whoever the teacher is, if it's a sensei or a Roshi. But yeah, the teacher needs to approve uh the student's under or the practitioner's understanding of the koan. And uh 
just as an aside, uh, in the lineage of which I'm a part of, the White Plum Asanga, uh, which is a lineage that is um, the the root teacher of that lineage is a, a, a Japanese teacher named Maizumi Roshi. Akio Taizan Maizumi Roshi. He's deceased now, but he he had 12 successors, and those 12 successors have created uh, many successors. So I think there's something like 150 white plum teachers worldwide now. But again, in in our lineage, if if one is doing the entire koan curriculum, you know, there's something like nearly 700 of these koan. How many does one need to do? Well, I did all of them. That's great. I wish I could and- have a book with 700 <laughs> koans to play with. I love that stuff. Uh, you would love it. I, I, loved, I loved every minute of koan practice, even when I was tearing my hair out because, you know, <laughs> the, you know I, I just couldn't penetrate. You know, but yeah. everybody goes through that, and that's part of the whole process because you ha- you have to learn to let go of looking good and being the best student and and all of that. You have to deal with your own resistance. You have to deal with, you know, uh, again feeling like you're looking stupid in front of your teacher and all of that. <laughs> and and that's all just as valuable yeah. as actually penetrating the koan itself. You know, and for everybody listening, we'll, we're, we're going to be getting into it. So if you don't know what a koan is, we'll, we'll be unveiling that amazing <laughs> little mystery. Yeah. So anyway, we, we, were, we were talking about, you know, what does Zen training or Zen practice really yeah. look like? You know, and in terms of sort of the formal aspect of training, you know, we've got the, the sitting meditation, we've got the, the relationship with the the teacher student relationship which is so central but we also do things like we clean and we cook and we th- those are really important parts of the practice too because we don't want to have a realization that only takes place on the cushion on the meditation uh-huh. cushion and is not integrated and carried out into everyday life and everyday activities right. So it's really important for us to to live together, to work together, to cook together, uh, to solve problems together. And this is a, you know, this goes way, way back to very early Zen when um, when uh, it was decided that Zen monasteries ought to be uh, self-sufficient and they started farming. And, Mm. you know, there's always a little bit of, or there's always some dependence on the local community for support, but it was very important for these, uh, these, uh, practice centers to become, you know, mostly self-sufficient. It sounds almost like a tribal experience. Well, I think that can, can be the case depending upon what you mean by that. Just a community of people that are closely knit that do things together that have a common objective. Yeah. Well, then I think that fits. I really do. And usually by the end of Sashin, that is our retreat. You know, people are feeling so close, so bonded. And, you know, there's ideally anyway, there's very little talking during these retreats because they're, you know, they're meant to be silent retreats. You know, we end Mm. up doing a little talking because we have to explain how to do certain things or sometimes in the kitchen with the cooking, uh, you know, we tend to talk too much, but it's mostly, (laughs) it's mostly silent. And it's amazing the kind of intimacy that can be engendered during those silent retreats. I think when you're not talking, you need to connect to someone on a deeper level. You got to pay more attention to their language, their gestures, their facial expressions, their postures, um, and their and the and the feeling that you're getting from whatever's being conveyed without words. I I, I just know from my own experiences of silence with people in my life, you know, whatever it might be, that it's like a little child that can't talk. You have to really pay attention, you know. Yeah, and I agree with you, Paul. And 
you know, something else that's, that's part of this equation is when you're meditating, and especially if you're, you're, you're doing an intensive, that is you're sitting for, you know, a week at a time, what happens is that you start, you know, your, your, your awareness or your consciousness, I never know how to talk about this, but it starts to dilate mm. and you become much more sensitive. Yeah. You know, everything is, uh, everything is, is, is more accessible to you. And so that, that also includes other people. You know, there's that, that people have related about Bodhidharma and somebody asked Bodhidharma, who's the legendary founder, the, the traditional founder of Zen, uh, people asked him what he was doing you know, when he was facing the wall for nine years in this meditation <laughs> cave. And he said, I was listening to the ants walking. Wow. And that, that sounds really crazy. However, when you, ha when you do sit for long periods, you do become extremely, extraordinarily sensitive to sounds, to mm -hmm. sights, again, to other people and so forth. So I always love that, you know, that line that he said. Hey, that's good. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Have you ever wanted to make a real difference in the world? CEO of the Czech Institute, Gavin Jennings, and I designed the Czech Academy to be the most comprehensive, complete system in the world for learning the art, science, and practice of holistic health. The Czech Academy is a multidisciplinary education system that teaches you all the essential functional anatomy, physiology, and assessments you'll need to identify the root cause of people's common body and health challenges. You will learn how to perform sensory, motor, autonomic nervous system testing, and specific orthopedic tests to determine exactly what is wrong with each client and what to do about the findings and which specific medical and healthcare professionals to refer to for a comprehensive multidisciplinary approach to healing, performance enhancement, and well-being. You will learn how to assess a client's diet and lifestyle factors to bring anyone back to balance and educate them and their family on how to stay healthy. The Czech approach isn't a this-for-that supplement-based approach, but is based on the science of organic farming principles and whole food nutrition, which is what we need in the world now more than ever. You will learn how to use work in exercises to calm the mind and cultivate life force energy. These practices are simple enough that anyone can do them and they support your immune system, calm and clear your mind, and are excellent for stress management. Work in exercises also integrate the brain, heart, and organ systems, making our internal systems much more stable while greatly enhancing our ability to heal from any health challenge or injury. All Czech Academy students are guided by highly skilled, experienced instructors and mentors and learn a scientific approach to stretching, joint mobilization, postural correction, movement skills development, corrective, and high-performance exercise. All the prerequisite training for each level of your journey through the Holistic Lifestyle Coaching and Integrated Movement Science Training Levels 1 through 5 are provided. You will be part of a tribe of healthy, open-minded people from around the world that share a genuine interest in mastery and helping people look great, feel great, and live their dreams. Students and graduates of the Czech Academy are successful in their own studios, clinics, have started their own health and healing retreats, work for elite sports teams, in big corporations, in gyms, physical therapy, chiropractic, osteopathic, and medical clinics, and have served as private coaches and guides for many elite people, ranging from those in the movie, music, dance, and other industries. As you are surely aware, there has never been a better time to master holistic health, corrective and high performance exercise. People are finally waking up to the fact that they need skilled, personalized help from people with genuine mastery because so many have been unable to get healthy through standard medical approaches. The Czech Institute is now accepting applications for spring semester of the Czech Academy. Applications close on April the 15th. The Czech Institute is offering three partial scholarships for the program, one in each region, North America, South Pacific, and UK plus Europe. To learn more and apply, go to academy.checkinstitute.com. That's academy.checkinstitute.com. Everything you need to know is right there for you on the website, and our staff is happy to answer any additional questions you may have. We don't believe in being average, but we do teach excellence. Join now and make yourself invaluable.
One thing I wanted to ask you about, just it's not something we planned on talking about, but I have a beautiful book in my library called Zigzag Zen. And it's mm. all about, it's m many different people, a lot of them Zen Roshis that, and it's about the use of uh, psychedelics in Zen. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it makes it very clear. There's a, like a real <laughs> dualistic sense of should, shouldn't from one Zen master or Zen Roshi to the next some very against it, some not against it. And it's a very well-written book and it, and it made me want to ask you, what, what is the general consensus on the use of plant medicines or psychedelics to support the meditative process, the opening process, or other aspects of a person's life? Mm, okay, really, that's a very interesting question. And I have not read that book, but I would like to read it. Okay, I'll, I'll write myself a note for you to get you the title, uh, oh, the information. It's a good book. Zen. It's made, it's really nicely done too. Beautiful, beautiful art. It's, it's a mm -hmm. very high quality book. It's nice to read. I am not aware of there being a, a consensus for or against the use of plant medicines, other kinds of psychedelics uh, as, as, you know, an adjunct to Zen practice. I know where the rub will be for, for many teachers, though, or for many practitioners more generally. And that is, you know, the Zen is, is practiced within the container of precepts, you know, precepts that are basically, you know, guiding us in more of a moral direction on uh, how to live our lives. And one of the precepts says, avoid intoxicants. Now, there are different ways of interpreting uh, the precepts, and there are different ways of interpreting that particular precept, of course. Some people who, who might be maybe a, a little uh, more traditional than others might think that using a psychedelic is um, basically amounts to um, becoming intoxicated in, mm -hmm. in an, uh, in an unhealthy and unhelpful way. Yeah. Others may interpret that precept differently. You know, as, as many people have pointed out, perhaps the biggest intoxicant that we encounter in life is our own tendency to create stories, to live inside, uh, dreams, to become disconnected with our lives as our lives are unfolding, you know, our own gaining ideas, those can be extraordinarily intoxicating. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not surprised that this book might point out some, you know, strong disagreements among teachers. Uh, I don't think that there is necessarily a, uh, a, a problem there, I think that uh, the use of plant medicines, if it's appropriate, if there's, if it's done in a respectful ceremonial set and setting with a well-trained ceremonialist and so forth, that might be helpful to a particular person. Uh, yes, I do not recommend that to my students. I don't want to put myself in the position of recommending that to a student because they're, it's so fraught with with, you know, possible problems, you know, there's oh, yeah. be proper screening and yeah. again, no, it's, proper. It opens up a whole new level of complexity to have to manage. Yes. Most yes. people have a hard time paying their bills and getting along in their relationships, let alone throwing psychedelics in the mix. I mean, I, I personally am not against the use of plant medicines done the right way for ceremonially as you, ceremonially as you as you have just outlined but i've also in my career witnessed a huge amount of problems with it i, I just as yes. you're talking i i because i've read quite a bit of that book and i'm aware of the kind of the tension between those that say no and those that say yes which is reading that precept and making their own judgment of it 
And because there's so much psychedelic use today, and now you know mushrooms are starting to get legalized, and marijuana is legalized, and marijuana is class is technically a psychedelic. You know, as the environment change changes, people's needs change, people's interests change. Then, because so many people are hell bent to believe everything science says, you got piles and piles of science now showing all the benefits of ayahuasca and psilocybin and even other studies on other things from peyote to mescaline and LSD. So Mm -hmm. there's a very, as you know, I'm sure a very strong, it's called the third psychedelic revival going on right now. And they they historically happen whenever the world's really getting quite stressful, like Mm -hmm. during the Vietnam war and things like that. Mm -hmm. So I was just curious because there may be many listening that would feel inspired to try Zen, but they also might like using psychedelics. And so I, I wanted to bring that on the table because if if there's if that's something that they're very committed to, then it's probably something that they should bring up with a potential Roshi, wouldn't it be? Uh, yeah, I think that would be really important for them because the, the Roshi might be able to help them integrate their experiences. And, you know, the Roshi might be picking up on something. Um, you know, people can become, as you know, pretty ungrounded sometimes. <laughs> yeah. And, um, you know, Zen is a very grounding set of, you know, it's a very grounding practice. Yeah. And um, so Zen might be very, very helpful to somebody who is uh, working with with plant medicines but yes the the short answer is yeah i would i would encourage someone to talk about that with with any uh with any dharma teacher any zen teacher that they're working with yeah i'm glad you answered that one of the questions i wanted to ask you is that there there's a number of people out there that actually refer to zen as a religion because of its connection to buddhism but then there's several Zen masters that I've studied who state that Zen is not a religion. I believe that DT Suzuki says Zen is not a religion is one that I remember studying, um, whose writings I find very interesting, by the way, he's quite Mm -hmm. a good writer. Mm -hmm. What's your take on it? Is Zen a religion or no? My take would be to kind of explode the question, Paul, you know, go ahead. (laughs) (laughs) Zen is your life. Uh, I realize that sometimes it's Im- important to to fit things into these uh, categories. There might be practical reasons for doing that, but it isn't always important to do that. Very often, you know, if somebody's kind of hooked on that question, it's because they have some kind of agenda. You know, they really <laughs> want it to be a religion, or they really don't want it to be a religion, and so then the real question is. What's going on here? You know, why, you know, why is this such an important question for you? And, and, you know, look into that. My experience of people that want something like Zen to be a religion is that they want somebody to tell them what to do so they don't have to think for themselves. Mm -hmm. We probably all want that at one time or another. (laughs) At one time or another. Yeah, when I was <laughs> six, maybe. Yeah. Which brings my next question, because this is another question that hovers out there. Is Zen mm-hmm. a philosophy? Well, this is, I think this is what I would say about that. You know, going back to the to very early Zen teachers and zooming ahead to the present, we often find... Um, very authoritative, very illustrious Zen teachers warning us not to philosophize, not to, you know, make into metaphysics or metaphysical claims, um, you know, our Zen, uh, our Zen understanding. Uh, don't confuse doing philosophy with practicing Zen. So that you know, that goes way back. You know, some of these old teachers would really ridicule monks who came in and who would sort of show off their philosophical chops, you could say. Yeah. And then, you know, they'd get 
kicked out of the room or, or rung out of the room and so forth. And again, we find that <laughs> carry forward. Uh, Maizumi Roshi, again, the founder of the lineage in which I trained, I, I, didn't, I didn't have the opportunity to train with him, but I know he says in many of his Dharma talks, he says, you know, don't get involved with this in an intellectual way. That's always going to get you in trouble. Mm-hmm. So I would say, you know, the practice of Zen is is not um, the practice of philosophy. Zen would sort of, Zen includes everything. It includes your whole life. But if you think that reading about Zen or you know working philosophically is the same as practicing Zen, I would I would caution somebody to to rethink that. And uh, but th- that being said, there you know in the history of Zen, I think there are certainly are philosophical texts that have had relevance for Zen. In other words, there are actual metaphysical statements that are often threaded into the the background and context of Zen. Yeah, I. I- I, I mean, I've read a number of books, and and I know D.T. Suzuki, for example, talks about different structure stages of consciousness, prajna, and various other things that that I don't think any philosopher would would uh, see as other than philosophical um, structure, disposition, or a way of mm-hmm. uh, what I perceive it to be is that somebody like D.T. Suzuki is trying to explain Zen in the context that an a person who maybe is philosophically oriented can understand it mm-hmm. so that there's yeah. something for them to grab onto. Cause <clears throat> my experience of Zen is, it, is it's kind of like a greased pig. It's really a hard thing to pin down. That's right. And in fact, that, I mean, that's one of the most profound things that we learn in Zen is not to grasp for something to, to, to hold onto in order, in other words, not to pin, not to be pinned down, not to try to pin down really any aspect of your life. And I, you know, I think there's a lot in Zen that has philosophical relevance, uh, for sure. There's a lot there that philosophers would be interested in. But I would say that, you know, it's not sort of the heart of the Zen project, if we can even talk that way, uh, to create you know, any kind of system or theory of reality or, you know, of anything else that might be of interest to a philosopher. It's, 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 it's very practical. It's very practical. And sometimes it's very hard to tell the difference, you know, between a, you know, a metaphysical statement or a metaphysical view and words that are being used uh, really just to kind of help move your understanding to a deeper level. In other words, w- words that sound philosophical, but they're really practical. They're really, yeah, they're really practical. I've got two questions that come to me in this regard. Because of everything you've just said and, and, and using the grease pig analogy and then the sort of Zen Roshi's masters, whatever, encouraging their students not to philosophize it, you know, My experience of philosophy, and I've studied a a tremendous amount of it, I consider myself a, 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 you know, a practical philosopher, really. Um, A philosophy, I think, is it allows a person to have a structure that can contain their, their values, their orientation, toward what the meaning of life is, why am I here, why are we all here, what is life for, um, and as you know, the, ra- the range of philosophies out there from existentialism to the opposite extreme is very vast, so mm-hmm. um, I, I think you know the way a person philosophizes their life just is a mirror of the internal uh, relationship that person has with life. Mm-hmm. In other words, an existentialist has a kind of a unique relationship with <laughs> not life. But um, um, the the reason I'm asking the question is 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 I wonder 
how how do people spend you know years in Zen, and if they really live that life, go about life without some kind of a container for their experience or their way of relating, or how do they set up a value structure so that they know when to say yes and when to say no? Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a, it's a really good question, and 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 first of all, I I, I do want to. Uh, clarify that I, I certainly don't want to suggest that Zen is somehow anti-intellectual or anti-philosophy. You know, the problem with philosophizing comes with with the manner in which we hold our philosophical ideas. If we're holding our philosophical ideas as a means of creating an identity mm-hmm. and as a means of of trying to create a you know a nice clear unmessy world <laughs> well <laughs> we're just going to have problems with that <laughs> we're going to yeah. suffer for one thing yes yeah. see how you do in a lockdown with that one yeah and and we're going to you know we're going to we're going to confine ourselves in ways that are just not necessary so we can do philosophy i do philosophy you know, but I try to hold it with an open hand, you know, say, here's a, you know, here's a really interesting view, or this is a really helpful and insightful way uh, to look at things or to, you know, articulate a problem or something like that. But again, I try to hold it with an open hand so that it doesn't become, again, a place of limitation and confinement and so that, and again, so that it doesn't become, again, just something to identify with and build up a stronger and stronger sense of, of me. Right. So that's, yeah. so that's one thing. It's, it's, you know, how are you doing the philosophy? Well, how are you holding it? So that's really important. But in terms of, um, you know, where does Zen you know, find a way to align with certain values and so forth. There's a lot in the sort of the whole container of the Zen uh, tradition that helps with that. I mentioned a few minutes ago that there are these precepts and some of them go way, way back to the time of the Buddha. And like any uh, living, growing tradition, they've been, uh, these precepts have been revised and tweaked and, and, and that sort of thing, there are definite values there. The value of compassion, for example, uh, the value of developing uh, goodwill and not cultivating ill will and hatred and, and greed. Um, all those things that uh, people might associate with early Buddhism, if they know anything about early Buddhism and the ideals of, um, you know, non-attachment and, again, in, in inclusion and um, sort of cutting off the roots of greed, hatred, and ignorance, all of those are, are part of the container of Zen. And so it, it's not just rootless in the sense of, of anything goes. Right. It's really not. Yeah, well, I, 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 I like, this is why I'm asking you these questions, because, mm-hmm. you know, as long as Zen's been around, it's still not that well understood in the Western world. Um, and it's not easy to understand. I probably read a dozen books no. on Zen, and I have a sense of it. I've had friends that are Zen practitioners. I've had students that have spent years studying with masters and given me books by their masters. But if somebody was to say to me, Paul, what is Zen? Probably the closest thing that I would be able to do is I would say, hold out your hands. And then I would start pouring water and see if they could hold the water because I wouldn't really know what else to say. You know, So you can't really hold that water in your hands for too long. It's going to find a way out. I, I don't know. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm, I've never tried to, to describe Zen, but I, I don't, I'm a very visual person. So when I think of myself, what is Zen? I just see two hands 
and someone pouring water into them. And you're both trying to hold the water, but you have the complete realization you can't hold it. It'll either evaporate or it'll sink through. So if you want to drink some, drink some. But if you try to not let it escape, then you're probably, that would be the expression of maybe closed mindedness or trying to conceal Zen into a tight container. That's the only way I can do it. Maybe you can work with what I've just shared and fix it. <laughs> well, it, it, it's a lovely image, and, and I have no doubt that, that, that that image could be worked in somewhere. But, but here's the thing. Um, well, let's, let's go back to a, a story about Bodhidharma. The yeah, legend, good. Yeah, because I was going to ask you. The legendary founder of Zen. That was my next question. Is, is, is he the founder of Zen, and how did Zen come about? So feel free to dive in right there. Okay. Okay. Let, let, let's do that. Um, <clears throat> let me tell you about, you know, one encounter that Bodhidharma allegedly had with Emperor Wu of, of the Liang dynasty. And Emperor Wu was, was this man who, uh, he really got into Buddhism. Apparently his, his wife who had died uh, appeared to him in a dream and told him that she had been reborn as a snake because of <laughs> because of some things she had done in her oh, well. previous life. And so the story goes that Emperor Wu uh, you know turned to Buddhism and got very excited about it and you know he supported Buddhism in all kinds of ways, funded it, helped uh, bring about translations of texts from India, uh, help fund practice centers and so forth. But again, and you know, I don't know if there's historical truth or accuracy to, to this encounter, but when Bodhidharma arrived in China from India and he had an audience with Emperor Wu, Emperor Wu was really eager to, to talk with Bodhidharma because Bodhidharma had this reputation for being, you know, a very ripe uh, Buddhist practitioner and teacher. And so the first question that Emperor Wu asked Bodhidharma is, you know, what is the fundamental principle of Buddhism? You know, what is it? Or, you know, we could use your question, what is Zen? Yeah. And uh, Bodhidharma said, vast emptiness, nothing holy. Vast emptiness? Vast emptiness, nothing holy. Nothing holy. Nothing holy. And so, That's interesting. I'd love it if you could expand on the nothing holy, because that can throw people into a real tailspin, oh, because it could be interpreted as that nothing is sacred. Yeah, and that, that, that's great. That's great when that happens, because if somebody <laughs> because if somebody goes into a tailspin about something, what you find out is here's something that they're saying no to in their uh -huh. life. Here's a, a condition that they're laying upon their own life. So it's really good to get that mirrored back to them. <laughs> it's really I good. Love it. You know, one of the, yeah. the best things that a, a Zen teacher can do for you is to pull the rug out from under you, <laughs> you know, and, and to, to leave you with no place to stand. Yeah. And I, th I think this is what one of the things that Bodhidharma did to Emperor Wu is, you know, he, he, he's really not withholding anything. He's, he's given Emperor Wu the whole ball of wax here. Yeah. He's this vast emptiness. And, you know, this, this emperor is somebody who's expecting to get a lot of praise and a lot of kudos for <laughs> what he has done yeah. to support Buddhism in China. You know, Buddhism is still pretty new in, in China. It didn't, it didn't start coming into China, um, you know, until around the first century. And so this is several hundred years later, but it's still new as traditions go. And so anyway, he's, he's rather shocked, you know, when Bodhidharma <laughs> says, you know, the Good. first principle 
Um, we need to shock uh, those emperors. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, and he's going to shock them even more in, in a minute. Have you got Bodhidharma's phone number? Because I want him to have a conversation with the World Economic Forum. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> I'll give it to you later. Okay. <laughs> but um, but he says, you know, the first principle of Buddhism is is vast emptiness. And as I was saying before, he's giving the emperor the whole ball of wax, you know, the profound insight that everything is empty and fluid and, and um, non-substantial, non-fixed, and uh, nothing holy. You know, there's, there's nothing holy, but there's also nothing profane either. Uh. Everything is empty. Mm-hmm. You know, he's he, he's you know he's probably zeroing in on what he thinks the emperor wants to hear, and then is pushing him in a different direction because this is what Zen teachers do when they suspect that a person is 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 kind of holding on to something, is kind of stuck uh, on something, maybe an idea or something. They try to push him in a different direction. Right. But anyway, I mean, there's lots more that could be said about that, but I I won't. But, you know, the emperor also wants to know how, how much merit he has received from all his good acts of supporting Buddhism. And Bodhidharma says no merit. <laughs> you know, no merit. And it's not like he's, he's just trying to insult him. But, you know, if everything from, you know, is ultimately empty. Do you mean merit like points to get to heaven kind of merit or... Merit, yeah, yeah. like we, we we're going to give you special privileges and and accelerate your training because you gave us all this money. Yeah, it's more like you know, um, Buddhist points, whatever that would am- amount to. Right. You know, Buddhist points to uh, you know, I don't know, to to a better rebirth or or something like that. Right. I'm not sure exactly what Emperor Wu's um, thoughts were about this um but something really interesting and this is to your question paul you know emperor Wu, he's he's really taken aback that you know here's this this monk who's going to talk to him this this way and who's not going to you know be kind of obsequious and and so on emperor Wu says you know who is this who's standing here before me. And Bodhidharma says, don't know. (laughs) Pujida, don't know. (laughs) And little does the emperor even suspect that Bodhidharma is demonstrating for him really kind of the heart of Zen. You know, and we could we could talk about the heart of Zen as as not knowing, mm. you know, not knowing, not in the sense of of ignorance, but not knowing in the sense of being open. Yeah, receptive. Receptive, not you know, hanging on to uh, what you consider your knowledge, not hanging on to ideas and concepts. child child mind. Yeah. You can call it, you know, beginner's mind. Yeah. You know, it's it's but it, but not knowing, not knowing, so important. And this is exactly what Bodhidharma was was demonstrating for Emperor. He's really demonstrating sort of the spirit of Zen. He's demonstrating his his awakened understanding to the emperor. But you know, the emperor is just simply not not prepared to <laughs> to get that you know to 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 really um be stimulated into a into a deep insight at least it appears that way hi everybody one of my favorite symbiotica products which i love to use when you got two kids in the house that bring home all sorts of stuff from school and have runny noses and coughs like kids often do. So if I need a little backup, I get out my Symbiotica liposomal vitamin C. Tastes great, feels great. I use it regularly. 
and it's just a good backup plan to support your immune system. But better yet, I've got Shervine, the creator of the product, right here to tell us more about it. So Shervine, what's unique about your liposomal vitamin C? Well, this has evolved over the years. This is our ninth iteration, and this is coming from fermented cassava, mm. not coming from corn. And it's in liposomal form, and we also have added compounds in there, including biotin and potassium bicarbonate, which is a very highly absorbing form of potassium. This right here is delicious. It is delicious. Okay? You know, we're using organic vanilla and organic extracts and citrus bioflavonoids, and you're getting a thousand milligrams of fermented vitamin C in liposomal form. So we're talking about pure absorption. So if you're, you know, you got the everyday cold or you're feeling the chills or you just need a boost in your immune system, boom, you can hit that right there. It's good for children. It's good for, you know, elderly. Anyone can have it. And it is one of my favorite products. Or if you're going to go on an airplane or being around a lot of people that aren't healthy and you just want a little immune backup or immune boost. Absolutely. That's delicious, mm. high absorbing, and gets to the subcellular level almost immediately. And kids love it. Kids love it. I haven't met anyone that doesn't like the flavor. It's beautiful. Yeah. So to get your Living 4D discount, go to symbiotica.com. That's C-Y-M-B-I-O-T-I-K-A.com. To get your 15% discount on checkout, use the code capital L, number four, capital D, 15. Enjoy your Symbiotica liposomal vitamin C. One of the questions that came up for me because of the description you just gave, um, it sounds to me just from Bodhidharma's answer to the emperor vast emptiness nothing holy it really lends itself to zen being a non-dual philosophy would, would you categorize zen as non-dual what i would say is that zen practice helps us cultivate non-dual wisdom uh-huh prajna non-dual wisdom yes yes, yes. Okay. So, uh, and is Bodhidharma the founder of Zen? Well, we could say that, that Bodhidharma is traditionally regarded as the founder of Zen. Now, as you can imagine, this happened a long time ago, and there's all kinds of scholarly debate about whether Bodhidharma even existed and, you know, what his role is. I happen to believe that Bodhidharma actually did exist. Uh, Andy Ferguson has a terrific book on tracking Bodhidharma. But, you know, it's not like Bodhidharma was the absolute first person to come from India to China and teach these practices that we now consider Zen practices. And, you know, we often like to think that politics doesn't play a role when it comes to determining lineages and so forth. But I'm afraid it does. Yeah. And one reason that's been suggested for Bodhidharma being sort of selected as the, you know, the founder of Zen is, has to do with Bodhidharma's politics. Uh -huh. Okay. So something about that exchange uh, with Emperor Wu that we were just talking about is very interesting because what we learn is that, you know, after they had this short exchange, Bodhidharma takes off. He crosses the Yangtze River and he goes up to Shaolin and he sits in a cave for nine years. Well, in other words, that encounter did not end up with Bodhidharma and the emperor becoming best buddies. <laughs> <laughs> and that may have been very, very important and, and attractive to many people. Because here's the thing. There was something in China at the time that some people now call imperial way Buddhism. And it's a kind of Buddhism that uh, is very metaphysical. It finds its basis in, in uh, certain sutras. I think the Lotus Sutra is one of them. But 
the, the important thing for us here is that in this imperial way Buddhism, what was it being attempted was a kind of fusing of imperial authority and Buddhism and Buddhist authority. Okay. And so this would make, um, you know, the emperor, I guess, you know, more or less a, a, a high, highly authoritative figure yeah. in Buddhism. And it, it, it's been put forward that Bodhidharma did not want to have anything to do with this. Getting involved with the emperor, getting involved with members of the royalty seemed to lead to very bad things. And there was precedent for that. So the fact that he seemed to avoid being, you know, in the, uh, you know, sort of under the sway of the emperor and of any, you know, highly placed political figures, that appealed to a lot of people. And so that might be one of the reasons why Bodhidharma, what the figure of Bodhidharma was, was selected as the as the traditional founder of Zen. How long ago was the period of Bodhidharma's life in just around what period? Yeah, um, well, there, there are certain, um, well, we think he, he may have died around 530. BC? No, uh, that would be uh, AD. AD. Or, or CE. Yeah. So it was, it may have been a little earlier than that. He may, I, I jotted down, if I can find it in one second, I'll tell you. Some people think that he actually arrived in China in 479 or thereabouts, and that he died around 530. Okay. Yeah. And some people place it a little bit after that but this is actually based on one of the more one of the earliest and more authoritative accounts of bodhidharma have you by chance read richard wilhelm's translation of the Tao Te Ching? not of the Tao Te Ching, uh just of the eijing okay because in the back of his translation after the 81 verses of poetry there's quite a comprehensive section where he explains a lot of things and in in there he very clearly describes the history of chinese emperors bringing in the spiritual masters of the day sucking as much information as they could out of them and then manipulating the teachings in order to make it look like spiritual teachings but actually use it as a means of controlling people and so this, I, I, the, I, I share this because it seems to me Bodhidharma was very hip to the history of that kind of behavior. Yes, people consolidating their power by, uh, you know, by by uh, insinuating themselves into the into religious authority or whatever you want to call it, Buddhist authority in this case. Yeah. One of the questions that came up, that not directly related to this, but something that I. I'm interested in hearing from you. How does Zen stand in relationship to sex? Like mm -hmm. sexual intercourse, sexual relationships. Mm -hmm. You know, for example, uh, you know, Tantra has uses sex as a vehicle for spiritual evolution. Um, and then you have many religions that have all these limitations on sex and you can only have sex if you're married and, you know, like Christianity and, and all this other stuff. So I'm just curious, how does Zen deal with sexual relationships? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a really good question. And, and there's much more I would like to know about that. And uh, I think uh, Bernard Four has some, some interesting material on that. But what I can say is... Um, you know, one of the Buddhist precepts is has to do with not abusing sexuality, not using it as as a you know as a form of of you know destructive behavior or again ab abuse. 
So that's a, you know, and that's a, that's a pretty strong statement. Yeah. Um, but, but something just a little bit on the more practical side or, or on the practical side is that in Japan, um, Zen monks, uh, Zen priests, Zen practitioners are often married and have families. That's different from in China, as far as I know. If you're ordained as a Zen monk in China, you don't get married. And Do they you, practice celibacy then? Yes, I yeah, I, I believe so. They are if they are living as monks in a monastic setting, they are practicing or supposed to be practicing celibacy. Right. Can you share an overview of Zen and what makes Zen distinctive from Buddhism itself as a spiritual path? And is Zen even considered a spiritual path? Okay, all all good questions, all really good questions. Um, Zen is certainly a development of Buddhism, so uh -huh. it's it's you know squarely a part of the the Buddhist tradition, and the Buddhist tradition is huge. You know, it's yeah. been going on for several thousand years, and it's alive and it's growing and you know changing and and so on. But it's clearly a part of the Buddhist tradition, and more specifically, it's a part of Mahayana Buddhism, uh, which is the Buddhism that developed in you know up in 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 China and and uh, Korea and Japan and and uh, other places in East Asia. But something that distinguishes Zen from, let's say, the other schools of Chinese Buddhism, and and just a word about terminology. We you know we've been talking about Zen, and and Zen is the Japanese name for this family of traditions that we're talking about. But Zen is really a Chinese phenomenon, at least originally. Oh. So in, in, in China, it wouldn't be called Zen. It would be called Chan, Chan Buddhism. Right. Although in, in some places in China, Chan is, is pronounced pretty much like Zen. Oh. <laughs> okay. But it, you know, it means meditation. Oh, okay. So, again, my point is we're, we're talking about a, a Chinese development of Buddhism. And it's really different from the other schools of Buddhism because in China, because most of the other schools of, of Buddhism, they, they kind of grew up around a certain doctrine or a, a certain sutra or set of sutras. And, you know, they're, they're, they're often more philosophical. Okay. And Zen did not grow up that way. Zen grew up around practices, mm. you know, seated meditation, walking meditation, as Zen developed as its own distinctive um, uh, branch of, of Buddhist practice. It, it also added practices like the work practice we were talking about, farming, um, uh, the teacher-student relationship is is such a huge uh, part of Zen. The, the these encounters, and perhaps most importantly, you know, where does Zen you know trace its authority to? Well, ultimately, not to a sutra, not to a philosophy, but to the mind of the Buddha. Ah, to the mind of the Buddha. And ultimately, for you know, for every Zen practitioner, the ultimate authority is the mind. Yes, that each one of us is the Buddha mind. Each one of us, you know, has this uh, Buddha nature or original mind that is innately or intrinsically awake, but we don't see that. You know, experientially, we don't. We often are are not realizing that. Um, so again, back to your question, you know, there are a lot of things that make Zen a distinctive 
tradition or family of traditions. You know, it's it's got its own history. It's got its own history of illustrious teachers. It has its own practices. It has its own very unique literature. Okay, including the the koan literature we've talked about. Um, you know, it has its own poetics. It, you know, it's a, it is a very distinctive um, family of traditions. But I, but the main thing here is, you know, it, it really traces its authority to the mind of the Buddha. And again, not to philosophy or books or doctrines or sutras. Yeah, I having read a number of. Zen books, and I've probably got two or three books of koans in my library, and also having read a number of books, Buddhist-based books or Buddhist authors and Buddhist, lots of Buddhist sutras, I personally find myself more attracted to the Zen writings because of the simplicity of them. And I find that the, the poetry and the writings that I've studied on Zen leave more space inside of me to digest what is being conveyed. Whereas I find with the Buddhist writings in general, I'm much more in my intellectual mind trying to process this massive amount of information. So, you know, I just find that attractive to me. Maybe it's because, you know, I'm over 60 and I'm not so excited about constantly thinking so much anymore. So when I read a Zen book and I have several great ones in my library, I, I just feel like, you know, Einstein said, if you, if you can't teach something to a 12 year old, you don't really understand it yet. And I think Zen kind of takes that approach. It's like, you know, chop, would carry water, rake the grass, you know, be present with it versus all this, you know, inner dialogue and, and debate. And I, I find a lot of Buddhism can get extremely heady compared to Zen. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree with you. And, you know, there are stretches of Buddhist history where, you know, Buddhism becomes very scholastic, very, very heady. Yeah. And um, and Zen really does not want to carry that forward. Zen is very um, it's 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 about realizing your life, and you know it, it's it's very experiential. It's about opening us up to our life as it is. And we can't do that by reading books or, you know, creating big, um, you know, sophisticated systems of, of thought and so forth. And Zen develops a very interesting um, relationship or, with or use of language. You know, I, I think the Taoists have their fingerprints all over Zen and especially uh, Zhuangzian Taoism. Mm -hmm. And as you know, Paul, the, the, the Taoists had a, a very healthy suspicion of language. <laughs> they realized that life always outstrips our words, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Finger pointing at the moon is not the moon. Right. And, you know, Zen is very much like this. I think Zen takes a lot from Taoism. Mm -hmm. And so, what what happens is the tradition develops um, a very playful um, and a very effective relationship with language such that language gets used as a way of unhooking people from language. Even from the mind, I find. Well, from the, yeah, from the certain kind of mind, you know. Yeah. Certain, um, uh, you know, the mind that's caught up in ideas and, and stories and, and trying to, uh, you know, capture everything. There's nothing wrong with that mind. It's, it's, a part of, it's a part of life. 
it's, you know, it's, it's a part of this wondrous, wondrous thing that we call our lives. But the problem is, is if, you know, if we're always kind of caught up in, in our dualistic thoughts, and if we're always, you know, using language and so forth to create an identity for us, we, we may not uh, we may not get to realize our life at a very, um, for lack of a better word, at, at a very intimate level. Yeah, that, that brings up a, a question for me uh, that I'm curious to hear you answer. Um, how does, what does Zen have to say about what life is or what it's for? Well, that's interesting. I would say, don't know. <laughs> yeah. Um, what's, Zen, what's Zen's conception of an afterlife? Well, in the background of Zen, there is there is the traditional notion of um, uh, rebirth. Reincarnation. Rebirth, yeah. Uh-huh. It doesn't come up that much, but it's definitely part of the Buddhist container of Zen. And, um, but, but here's the thing, you know, one of the, the one of the, the most important insights that the Zen practitioner has is into the empty fluid nature of everything. And so we can say there's no birth, there's no death, there's no one mm. who dies. There's no one who is born. That's the non-dual uh, aspect. Yeah. Yes, that's the side of emptiness, the side of oneness. From the water side, because Zen recognizes or, or, or Zen realizes life, to put it one way, from sort of two different aspects. On the one hand, there's that side of emptiness, oneness, no thingness. Okay? Yes. On the other hand, there's this life of phenomena, all these different things, all this richness, all these flowers and insects and clouds and people and tables and chairs. And, and that's a side um, where we experience cause and effect. That would be the side of karma. Well, so Zen doesn't deny that, but it does affirm that, okay, on the one side, all this diversity, all these phenomena, all these forms, these different forms, sometimes we refer to this as the side of difference, but ultimately the side of difference and the side of emptiness are not separate yes. or unified. So on the one hand, karma, rebirth. On the other hand, all empty. No one to be born. No one to be to die or to be reborn. Mm. And when our understanding is very ripe, you know, we integrate that understanding of the side of empty oneness, emptiness and oneness, and the side of form or difference. Mm -hmm. And so we can appreciate life even as we, and appreciate the diversity of things, even as we appreciate the empty nature of everything. Yeah. I think it's, it takes a fair bit of um, the term that I, the only term I can come up with is psychological maturity to reach a place where you can handle living in the exchange of such complementary opposites, the emptiness of and the myriad of the no form and form, the, the non-being and the being. Um, most people's minds are very um 
binary. It's either zero or one. It's either one or the other. You know, it's you know sometimes called two value logic. Yes or no. It, it either is or it isn't. Um, be, you know, because a lot of the problem, of course, as you know, is that we, we're heavily steeped in scientific materialism, which, you know, if it doesn't, if you can't weigh it and measure it, it doesn't exist. So don't talk about it. Um, yeah. So I think what I'm sharing is, is it, it feels to me from my studies of Zen and, and even just listening to you talk, it's probably not something that somebody who doesn't have enough either past life experience or life experience to come to the point where they realize there's a lot more to life than, than on off. Yes. No, there, you know, sometimes it's called for value logic. Mm -hmm. Yes. No, maybe you've asked the wrong question. <laughs> you know, that's really, for me, I, I personally subscribe to four value logic and quantum physics really forces you to have to look at that very carefully um, because there you have the emptiness of the wave function and then you have the the phenomena of particles and, and form. I, I really agree with you, Paul. And, you know, Zen can be destabilizing. Yes. It stabilizes our, our views. Uh, um, and, you know, it might not always be the, the right practice for a person, or at least certainly there might be times in a person's life where what they, they, they need something kind of definite and uh, limited and stable and so forth. And so, you know, we, we have to be careful. You need to take care of ourselves. And, and, and this is one of the reasons why Zen students or Zen teachers and, and students need to get to know each other really well. Yes. See, it's coming more clear now. This is why I'm asking you all these additional questions, because I'm trying to think for the audience. I'm trying to say, you know, if I was listening to this and I wasn't Paul Check, who'd read thousands of books and been involved in spiritual practices all his life and has worked with thousands of people. And, you know, like being around people of all different walks of life, I've, I've, I've had the time to, you know, what's it like to be with a bunch of Buddhists? What's it like to be with a bunch of Hare Krishnas or, you know, and I personally dig all that. I'm like, like, I'm very interested. I love to hear what the Sufis have to say. In fact, I just interviewed a Sufi teacher this morning. Um, so for me, that's exciting and interesting. Um, but I... As you're talking, and I'm, I'm putting myself in the position of the listener, I can just intuitively sense for a lot of people, the the emptiness, it would almost like being going to buy a jug of milk and it's empty. And then you go back and say, that, 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 this is empty. And, and, the, and the cashier says, no, it's not empty. It's full. And you're like, wait a minute. Look, it doesn't weigh anything. You know. So the point is, a person often wants to go into some kind of spiritual practice or training because they feel something's missing in their life. So they want the jug to be full. They want something. And then you end up with a Zen Roshi and you're, you're getting more emptiness. Like Bodhidharma gave the emperor, you know, he, he, he didn't hand him any reward. <laughs> that's, that's what it sounds like. And, you know, very often when, when people come to, something that we could just call it a spiritual practice. They're looking, they're really looking for kind of a new improved me. Yeah. Okay. And in general, and very often they're, what they're imagining is somebody who's, you know, still very much like them. Okay. But again, kind of new and improved, you know, uh -huh. there's something better about them, something more, excellent about them and that's fine that's a place to start yeah. but what ultimately happens in zen is that when we become really really intimate with life that is when we start realizing our life experientially at a very intimate level what happens is our sense of self drops off. Not yeah. 
No, it's always a temporary dropping off. Okay. It's but great it, though. <laughs> but it's, yeah, it, it, it's really important. And, you know, and, and, you know, we see through to the emptiness of, you know, what we regarded as ourself, you know, as we see through to the emptiness of, of, of everything. Now that might sound kind of nihilistic to somebody. It might sound like, oh, there's, you know, nothing. And, you know, so, you know, why should I, <clears throat> why, why would anybody sort of cultivate that kind of experience? And I guess what I would say is, uh, first of all, I don't, wouldn't say everybody should do that. Not at all. But more to the point, it's, it's precisely because of the emptiness of everything that there's oneness. Of it. There's oneness. And, you know, as we open to that emptiness, which we are, okay, there's tremendous freedom in that. Tremendous freedom in that. But a lot of people can't handle freedom. That's one of the challenges. Well, that's that's true. That that that's absolutely true. There might be people who are uh, just they just need to live their life in 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 a different way. They're not ready to to. It's you know it's a kind of opening, as we say. It's a kind of opening to life as it is, and there might be. And I know there are many people who are not ready for that, and that's fine. That's the journey that they're on. And there might be, you know, other paths that might be much better for them. But what, what the point that I, I'm really kind of struggling to make here is that emptiness is actually supreme fullness. Yeah, yes, it is. Yes. It's the, it's the source of all that is. It, it's the wellspring of creativity. And we are all together one. Hi, everybody. This is Paul Check. I come to give you a little message. I want to share some empathy. I know how hard it is to change your behavior when you got some bad diet and lifestyle habits and you look at that coffee or you look at the sugar or you look at the junk food that you're in love with and you reach for it because it's quick and easy and you keep telling yourself, I need to change, I need to change, I need to change. But eventually the system breaks down and you get motivated by the pain teacher. But what if I gave you an opportunity to try something that would help you start the process of behavior change and enjoy it and look forward to it? Well, I have something for you. It's Organifi's Red Juice. It tastes great and it's loaded with nutrition and lots of vitality for you. And I got Drew Canoli here to tell us why it works so well for behavior change and increasing your life force and your vitality. Drew, what's some, what's the magic in that red juice? Because everybody seems to love it. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Paul. Sometimes when we're craving things, mm. it's hard to switch a, a habit, yeah. a behavior. Yeah. So I looked at that fundamental fact and I'm like, well, what could we create that people could crave mm. that actually tasted great? Mm -hmm. And that's when red juice was born for Good. energy. So between the berries, the blueberries, the raspberries, mm. the strawberries, yes. the best quality organic glyphosate residue free, yes. the rhodiola and the cordyceps, yes. we were onto something. We sweetened Definitely. it with a dash of monk fruit mm. and literally I started to come to life. When I drank this, I had yeah. so much more energy than I would mm -hmm. normally have. Stamina went through the roof. Yeah. I actually shaved off 45 seconds off my mild time drinking red juice before I ran. Wow. Talk about an uptick in nitric oxide production in your body, right? <laughs> Something went up. Yeah. <laughs> we know speed Actually, <laughs> it's funny you say that because I get messages all the time about sexy time. Oh, and yeah? When people drink red juice. Something's like, going up. <laughs> Something's going up. And I got so many messages about that. That's funny you brought that up. Well, but, we hope it's the flag these days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so if you're looking for more energy and stamina and something that tastes great to where you could shift your cravings, yes. keeping your hunger and your energy in check. And feel good about it. And feel good about it. And you might even break down a little bit and wander back. But if you've got some natural sweetness and a lot of nutrition, you probably, if you're honest with yourself, won't need as many chips or as many mm -hmm. of whatever your little 
thing is yeah. but you can do this naturally and easily and that's what i'm all about naturally and easily and honestly and you know it all starts with being honest with yourself so if you want a great tasting behavioral switch technique that's really good for you it has a lot of knock-on benefits for you and your whole family try red juice go to organifi.com o-r-g-a-n-i-f-i.com and because i love you living for you listeners so much i've organized for you to get a 20 percent discount with the code capital c capital h capital e capital k 20 and that's as fast as i can say that i love you guys enjoy your red juice You know, as you're talking, and I'm just because I'm 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 not just listening; I'm feeling what's happening to me as you talk. And and what rises up in me is that Zen seems like a paradoxical training to fully embrace life that ultimately prepares you for death. Because if you can reach the point where you can really embrace life in its fullness while realizing behind it is emptiness, then the, the, the concept of death doesn't seem to have such claws anymore because you're, you've already kind of become acquainted with the emptiness. It's become your friend and it's not such a scary thing anymore. Does that seem correct? I think that's very well put. You know, this is what we're, we're, we are looking into this great matter. Yes. <laughs> and again, when we penetrate through to the empty nature of everything, you know, we see that death is empty, life is, 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 birth is empty too. But again, you know, from this other side, the side of this myriad forms, there's life, there's death, there's, uh, again, cause and effect and there's me and there's you and so on. but but we learned how to integrate all those things and and I think you're exactly right thank you, know, you. Is, you can think of a you know um, you can think of it as a preparation you know Socrates thought of philosophy as a preparation for death but I think we could say the same thing of Sam yeah good now another question that I didn't have on the list, but I think it's important. Since you've studied so much Jung, you will be very aware of why I'm asking this question. How does Zen deal with the concept of meaning? Because when you're dealing with embracing emptiness, mm -hmm. it it's a very hard thing to dress meaning up with. And from my own work, my own life, my own research, I've found that if a person doesn't have a sense of meaning in life, they're almost always in some kind of trouble or they're about to be in trouble. Um, I'm curious, how does Zen address, handle, or use the concept of meaning? Okay. Well, meaning is part of life. You know, meaning is, as we might say in a Buddhist context, meaning is, meanings are dharma too. And, and again, we hold two sides. You know, on the one side, meaning, meaning can be very important to us. You know, uh, grasping meanings or having meaning or holding on to meaning has its own consequences. On the other side, meaning is as empty as anything else, okay? And we hold both. Mm -hmm. You know, there are Zen koans where, where people get really chastised for hanging on to no meaning or hanging on to no words, okay? In other words, people might get stuck on the side of emptiness, and that's not a full realization. That's not ripe practice. I yeah, I yeah, I understand. I always, you know, there's there's, you know, a full uh, um, or a, a more mature understanding is also going to really appreciate again the side of form, the side of phenomena, the side of difference, or in this case, the side of meaning. Mm -hmm. 
So yes, meaning is completely affirmed in Zen, but at the same time, meaning is empty. Yeah, I, I can see that meaning can actually become um, concretized. It can become a statue, a sculpture, a um, something to fight for. Um, in other words, if one concretizes meaning, then they're they're letting go of the emptiness of it all. So now they're making something out of nothing, and yeah. I, I think that can lead to to uh, challenges on many levels in relationships. Because as soon as you concretize meaning, now you have opposition for people who don't agree with it. And it seems like Zen tries to be more water-like and not get too overly um, drunk on your meaning concepts to the point where you start defending them and things like that. But one of the things that really keeps rising up in me listening to you talk about Zen is it really brings me right to Jung's concept of holding the tension of the opposites because it seems Zen really is kind of like a a, a balanced beam scale, but it sits right in the middle at the axle. It's not on either side. Yeah. Well, uh, let me back up a little bit. You know, about this meaning. Again, how are we holding the meaning? Yeah. You know, is it something that we're using, again, to create an identity, to create, a, you know, a, a, a more and more substantial sense of self? Mm -hmm. We might be doing that, and we should just be aware there, there are consequences of, of that. We're going to create suffering for ourselves and confinement uh, experientially of our lives. I can see from our conversation that I can see why it takes quite a long time as a Zen practitioner to really be able to fully understand, embrace and 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 kind of live zen because of this holding the tension of the opposites this this substantial insubstantial there not there form emptiness it it's it's really um the the vision i get is being a martial artist who's fighting blindfold blindfolded mm -hmm. you, you know there's nothing there, but there's definitely something there because it can hurt you. <laughs> and yeah. so to, to be able to be an effective martial artist with your eyes closed, you have to do a lot of practice and a lot of personal growth and and development of your, your perceptual apparatus. Um, and so just like it takes, you know, someone who's spent a lot of years in Zen would walk through a forest and be aware of a lot more than somebody who just jumped out of a Sunday school, for example, or a, or a church meeting, you know, um, in, as a general theme. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask you about is that there's now, as I'm sure you're very well, multiple forms of mindfulness training and practices. They're starting to pop up like mushrooms all over the place. It's my understanding that mindfulness as a concept and a practice has Eastern origin from Buddhism and Eastern religions in general. I don't know for sure it comes directly from Buddhism, but there's also now a number of Western approaches. I'd love it if you can explain the difference between mindfulness as commonly taught today in Eastern religions or even Zen or mysticism, then the New Age movement, and then there's the corporate hospital programs like those created by John Kabat Zinn. So how does Zen fit into or differenti differentiate itself from some of these different concepts, just so people listening could maybe have a, a better understanding of what mindfulness is and how Zen fits in relative to some of these other things? Okay. Um, mindfulness, at least in, in what I am familiar with, you know, it, it really comes from early Buddhism. Uh -huh. You know, there's a, there's a very early sutra called the Four Foundations of Mindfulness. 
And in that sutra, the, the Buddha is teaching all these different mindfulness practices, like starting with mindfulness of the breath and mindfulness of the body and, and so on. And it, it gets, it, it, it's quite a comprehensive uh, sort of manual of mindfulness practice. Um, so it has very early, it has, it has deep roots in, in very early uh, Buddhist literature and practice. I, from what I know of the sort of mindfulness programs, and, and, and I don't, I don't want to claim to know a lot about these programs. I just haven't looked into them. I, I did read John Kabat-Zinn's book, a, you know, long, long, long time ago. And I, I think this approach does owe a lot to this early Buddhist uh, mindfulness. Um, but I just think that the, well, you know, first of all, the, the overall context is different. Um, I think people in some of these mindfulness programs, you know, they, they're not taught anything about Buddhism. But of course, I don't want to generalize because I really don't know. You know, yeah, know these specific programs, but but I think a lot of what they're doing, which I believe is quite valuable, but I think a lot of what they're doing in the mindfulness programs is they're they're learning to um, to respond to stress. Yeah. Stress is a form of suffering, so it's it's you know it's 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 a, it's a Buddhist thing. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and it's, it's teaching us to be more aware of, of our lives. And it's, and it teaches people to, um, to, to be more like impartial observers of their own reactions and of their own sensations and perceptions and so forth. So I have no doubt that these mindfulness programs are offering something quite valuable. Now, I don't know that you know they're that they're cultivating something there though that's that might cultivate a, a, a very deep realization of one's life you know right. that's you know that's where the buddhists are are, are going with it um, so, you know, it's like, you know, the difference between therapy and, and Buddhism, you know, the, the therapist is addressing problems and addressing symptoms and, 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 and that kind of thing. They're not necessarily, although I'm sure it happens, they're not necessarily ha helping their client, um, to really examine their life at this very deep level. Mm -hmm. Again, I think it could happen, but that's not generally the intention, at least as far as I know, at least as far as I know. So, you know, I think there are, are differences and I think there are good reasons to appreciate all these different approaches. As far as Zen goes, I mean, mindfulness is not a Zen practice per se, but I, uh, I encourage my Zen students to uh, to practice certain mindfulness practices. I give them a very abbreviated version of the four foundations of mindfulness. I really encourage them to um, to do a mindfulness practice called hindrance practice. You know, is that something simple you can describe? Yeah, very simply. Um, you know. You know, we all experience really contracted states. You know, they could be could be a state like anger, or it could be a state of grasping, yeah, uh, or a state of lethargy, or or whatever. And what we do in hindrance practice is, you know, the Buddha talked about these five hindrances, these five sort of clusters of contracted states. And 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 another reason why we might call them contracted is because they you know, when we're in the in the grip of one of these states, we're often not aware of the, we're not awake to the present moment at all. We might be caught up in all kinds of stories and, 
you know, reactivity and so forth. So with, with this hindrance practice, um, you know, we choose one sort of cluster of hindrances at a time. So, you know, maybe the, there's a cluster that has to do with pushing away aversion, you know, pushing away hatred, anger, and so forth. So with the practice, you might focus on, say, that cluster. And then what you do is you make the intention to be very aware of whenever that hindrance is arising. So whenever you're feeling uh, hatred or anger, and what you do, you just watch it. You don't try to get rid of it. You don't try to um, counter it you know, with a more positive feeling or anything like that, you simply notice it. Oh, mm -hmm. what's happening in my body? Where am I? Is there a lot of gripping going on? Is my heart rate changing? What's happening in my thoughts? Are there a lot of thoughts coming up? And we just practice watching these things. Oh, anger is arising or aversion is arising. And it's a tremendously powerful practice. It's a it's a real detachment practice. Well, yeah, we we you know we we know we can we can de or disidentify mm -hmm. with these states of body mind as they're arising. And, you know, we don't have to be swept away by the anger or the uh, you know or the grasping or the aversion, whatever it is. And, and and yes, we we do develop this this real actually appreciation and mm. curiosity about these states that come up, but it does create that sort of like you said, like a kind of detachment from it. It's very powerful stuff, and I I would recommend anybody practice uh, hindrance practice. Yeah, I think it's a very important practice. I know I'm a very fiery human being, and it's just the nature of who I am. And with a background in, you know, martial arts, boxing, kickboxing, motocross racing, and, and things where, you know, intensity is like essential, or you're never going to be good at it, you know. Um, so particularly in my relationships with human beings because i'm also quite a hermit i don't like i spent so much time in my life teaching and traveling and being in front of large crowds and having people constantly wanting stuff from me yeah. so when i need to like a turtle come into my shell to to recover so i have something to give when i have to do it again i i can easily get triggered by people that keep wanting things or don't honor my request for quiet you know, like, okay, I'm going to go to my office. I got a lot of work to do. Please don't come in there and bother me unless it's an emergency. And next thing you know, someone's walking through the door wanting bubble gum or something. <laughs> um, so the point being is I found that mindfulness has helped me a lot with my relationship with myself and others because I'm able to, what I do is I describe to myself what's happening. I say, okay, I can feel I'm getting irritated right now. I'm seeing myself getting irritated, but I don't need to get irritated, you know, and then I might use a, a Buddhist saying this too shall pass. Just don't, don't, don't let it take you over. And so for me, using mindfulness that way, I think has calmed me a lot and helped me metaphorically not sweat the small stuff so much. Mm -hmm. I can see that because you know, there is just something magical about awareness. That's what's at the heart of all of these practices, is bringing greater awareness to our lives, to whatever is happening, whatever is unfolding in the moment. Yeah. And, um, you know, as opposed to, you know, kind of staying locked up in a, in a dream. Yes, or being too serious about things that aren't really, it doesn't really help. Um, how important is humor and playfulness in Zen? I think a lot of people really have lost their sense of humor today <laughs> and playfulness. 
Yeah. I, I, I think playfulness and humor kind of naturally arise in Zen. You know, when you've, when you've become, you know, really intimate with your life and, you know, your sense of self, you know, has, has really softened and at moments dropped away completely. You know, there is a freshness. You know, you, you start living from this fresh, very alive place. And that's a place where we play from. I mean, just to give you an analogy, you know, think of, um, I'm thinking of some like really master athletes like Steph Curry or in the surfing world like uh, Carissa Moore or Kelly Slater. And, you know, they've mastered their 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 sport their craft and when you see somebody at that level of mastery you see, you see them acting in in a very spontaneous way and and very often they're really having fun yes now watch steph curry warm up sometime who he's is steph car- curry he's um He's a basketball player. He plays for the uh, the Warriors. Oh, okay, yeah, I don't really watch sports. I haven't for a long time because after. Okay, so that's not a good reference for you. But you know, pick your you know, pick somebody who has mastered their craft so well that they 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 um, they don't think about what they're doing. Right. They're totally one with their activity, and you're familiar with Taoism, so. You know that notion of wu, wu wei, wu wei. Yeah, wu wei, action yeah. without action. Exactly, and 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 when you're in that place, um, you play, and you play with language. Some of the Zen literature has, you know, records of the Zen adepts, and they're playing. You know, they're trying to outdo each other. You know, using language but they're really playing together they're playing in samadhi there's they're playing in deep you know in from a deep meditative state paleo valley makes some incredible superfood bars that are a lot different than what most people think of as a superfood bar i've got autumn smith the creator of their superfood bars right here to tell you about them autumn what is so unique about your awesome superfood bars well our superfood bars are unique because not only do they not contain refined sugar or gmos or any of the freaky additives that you'll find in most bars or gluten or anything but they're just whole foods they're low in sugar they're made with superfoods like ginger and broccoli and acerola cherry and collagen from grass-fed and finished animals, which we all know is like a fountain of youth. And so the best part about them though is probably the flavor. They come in chocolate and apple cinnamon, and we have so many more delicious flavors to come. And they're easy to put in your bag to feed for you with your kids. And I hope you love them all as much as I do. All you have to do to get access is go to paleovalley.com and you can use the code CHECK15, that's lowercase C-H-E-K, 15, and you can get 15% off. And I hope you love them. That's awesome. And just so you know, that's P-A-L-E-O valley.com. And I know you're going to love Autumn Superfood Bars. You know, I've got many books with amazing stories of Zen masters that had some very unique uh, teaching skills, abilities, and all sorts of interesting things. Um, I've read several stories of Zen masters that can stop their heart at will. And some of them say be there dead with no heartbeat for as long as four days or a long one of I know it was four days. And then all of a sudden spontaneously just turn themselves back on like nothing ever happened. So I'm just curious if you if you feel there's any truth to these stories or are they just sort of allegorical? And if you have any fun stories of Zen masters you could share just to give us a sense of <laughs> what some of these masters were really like. Okay. Well, that's interesting about the heart stopping. Um, you know, I, I don't know about that. I, I know in Tibetan Buddhism, if you look at uh, um, Sogyal Rinpoche's uh, 
uh, book, the Tibetan Book of Living and Dying, he has some really interesting stories about, you know, related to that. This doesn't come up so much in Zen. And in fact, I can think of a, a Zen koan, a story, where the, the very point of it is that, you know, if, if you're working on sort of having these sort of special powers, like being able to to die at will or something like that. Yeah. Then you're you're really kind of missing the mark. Right. You know, you're missing the mark. Uh-huh. And uh but that said, you know, I've been on pilgrimage to uh, to Chan Buddhist uh, uh sites, you know, several times in China. And it's some of these very very old uh um Dharma seeds, you'll find two kinds of crematoria. You have one that's more vertical and one that's more, you know, uh, the, the opening is, is flatter, uh, shorter. And the, the first type is for the Zen, the Zen uh, practitioner who dies while doing seated meditation. <laughs> that's the vertical and, one? And that's, and that's clearly favored. <laughs> That's fun. And, and there are, you know, what we find in, I've definitely seen sprinkled in the Zen literature are, you know, Zen, uh, Zen masters who know when they're going to die and tell people that they're going to die on a certain, at a certain day and on a certain day and so forth. Yes. But it's, it's definitely, you know, there's definitely a value. It's better to go into that crematorium, you know, that is for, you know, sitting up, you know, they put, you know, they would cremate somebody who's still sitting in the zazen or the seated meditation position rather than in the supine position. Yeah. But yeah, um, I can, you know, again, I can think of at least two koans where, where it's ex expressly uh, indicated that trying to develop those kinds of abilities is really missing the mark. It's mm -hmm. missing the mark. You know, something that Lin Ji, somebody asked Lin Ji, who was a very famous uh, Chinese master, someone asked Lin Ji if he had super, you know, super normal powers. And he said, yes. <laughs> when I'm hungry, I eat. <laughs> when I'm tired, I sleep. <laughs> Those are superpowers. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least he listens to his body. That's his superpower. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, there are many Zen masters who, you know, done interesting things. Um, one of my favorites is is a man named Yento. He's Ganto. He's known as Ganto in Japanese. And I heard a really great story about it. He was just brilliant. I mean, absolutely brilliant. And uh, one story that I heard uh, from him, I heard it through Barry Kaigen Roshi, whom I think heard from Tenshin Roshi. And uh, these are all wonderful Zen teachers in Southern California. And the story was that when Yento, uh, what happened is there was a lot of, uh, looting and um, a lot of thievery going on in China, and, and these bandits would come into the the Zen temples and monasteries and 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 rob them and and hurt and even kill people. Yes. And so there's a story that you know Zento or, or sorry Yento was sitting in his temple. They knew somehow that the 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 bandits were coming. And so Yento told everybody to, to go, go, go hide in the woods till they're gone. And so the bandits came in and Yento is just sitting there. He's in, uh, he appears to be in very deep sitting meditation. And this really bugs the bandit. Mm-hmm. And he looks at him and he says, don't you know that I can kill you? And Yento says, don't you know that I can die? <laughs> and it's so wonderful because completely equal. 
Yeah. So one of the things that we 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 learn to do in Zen is we we learn to see see things from the side of equality. That everything, no matter what it is, it's all empty. From a certain side, it's all the same. So killing, dying, being alive, being the dead, completely equal. But can you imagine when you're being threatened with your life? Say, like, well, don't you know that I could die? Yeah, well, it takes the it disarms somebody because <laughs> they realize they, they don't really have any leverage over the person. Yeah. And the bandit did kill Yento. It's like he slit his throat or something. And, you know, one of the stories that comes up around that is that Yento screamed. And it was a scream that could be heard for, you know, miles around. And that actually bugged some later Zen practitioners. They thought, oh, if he was so enlightened, enlightened why would he scream like that? And what they, what it, it took them a long time to realize is that that scream of Yento's, okay, it contains the whole universe. Right. It's yeah. And the intimacy with that scream is like a great let go. Yes. Well, you answered my next question, which is how effective is Zen as a method for managing fear in a rapidly changing world? And you just described exactly how Zen addresses it. I think it can be very helpful. Again, those mindfulness practices that we talked about, very, very helpful. But also, you know, cultivating even mind, you know, right. this mind of equality, accepting whatever's happening equally, you know, things mm -hmm. that from our typical point of view, we say are just awful, don't want that, shouldn't happen. We learn to accept, say, well, this too. I include that too. We really learn to include everything. everything. Yes. Even, even Klaus Schwab. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I, I work on that with my mindfulness every day. <laughs> I, I, you know, I have many ways of approaching things like that just due to lots of life experience and looking at the history of the world. And I won't get into it because we would not be talking about Zen anymore, but um, I think people like that are an actual real opportunity for spiritual growth for all of us, um, except they those that, that can handle it as it is, you know. They are. And someone would encourage us to look at Klaus Schwab as the Buddha, too. Yes. Yeah. I'm the Buddha. I'm the Buddha. All Buddhas. All Buddhas. But it's hard. It takes practice. It does, yeah. Yeah. And uh, sometimes it's very hard to conceive of a Buddha quite from that angle. <laughs> it's, it's great. You it know, reminds me it reminds me of a Zen story. Someone asks a Zen master, he says, What is Zen? And the master says, Shit on a stick. Yeah. And right. so what is Klaus Schwab? Shit on a stick. <laughs> well, that, yeah, the, you could say, you know, what is Buddha? And yeah. you could answer. This would be a great answer for somebody who really, really hates Klaus Schwab. Um, you could say, what is Buddha? Buddha is Klaus Schwab. Yeah. Yeah. You could say, that would be, and, and that would be, a great answer for that person because they have to look into that. Yes, you bang up against the paradox and it 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 puts you up against yourself. Yeah. You have to look into that. Yes. Which okay. leads right to our next topic. You've talked a little bit about koans. Can you explain what a koan is, how they're used by Zen teachers, um, what the process is? Mm -hmm. And how how does a koan produce changes in a student? What makes it an effective tool is is the kind of the question here. Okay, I'll I'll, I'll take a stab at that. Um, koan, you know, koan is a kind of literature. You know, it's a kind of uh, these have been written down, and they can take the form of 
short dialogues between maybe a master and a student or between several Zen adepts, okay? It can take the form of maybe a line of poetry or a little portion of a, of a folk story or just a, a, you know, a saying that maybe was uttered by uh, some illustrious Zen teacher. And what's usually the case with these little bits of text is they encapsulate um, some understanding, okay, some, some insight. And what, but, but one thing we have to understand is these are usually uh, very puzzling and, or even nonsensical to our typical mind. To our, you know, to our uh, everyday Rational. discursive analytical mind. Mm -hmm. So, for example, you know, one koan, very short koan is, you know, empty handed yet holding a hoe or walking yet riding a buffalo mm. or, you know, bring me an immovable tree in a violent storm. Mm. Or, you know, what is the sound of one hand? Mm. You know, there, there, and, you know, there are lots and lots of these, but they don't make sense to our, again, to our normal discursive uh, conceptual mind. And so what happens is, I mean, there's a whole history to these things that people can, can look up for themselves. But what happens in, in Zen practice is that we're, we're, we're given a koan, we memorize it, and then in sitting meditation, we bring it up. We bring it up into our awareness periodically. It's not like a mantra that you repeat over and over again, but we bring it up into our awareness, and then maybe we follow our breath or you know, engage in other forms of sitting meditation. But what happens is after a certain amount of time, we become very intimate with the koan and the koan sort of has its own life. It, 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 it raises itself. And there's always some point, some point of understanding to be, uh, to be penetrated by the student who is, is sitting with the koan. And, and I don't mean to suggest you only work on the, the koan when you're doing sitting meditation, but that's a good place to start. If you're working on a koan, it's going to accompany you through your entire life. And I always warn people, try don't work on koans when you're driving. Mm -hmm. Yeah, your mind Not might get safe, too caught up. But, you know, I've had many koans pop while I was walking or you know, washing the dishes or doing something else. Yeah. They really become very, like, you become very intimate with the koan or it becomes intimate with you. And so what the way it, it works sort of, you know, just sort of the mechanics of it is the student will go into one of those private interviews with the teacher and the student will attempt to demonstrate their understanding of the koan. Now, it's not what, what, what will capture and what will sort of be a passing demonstration of understanding is never explanatory. You, you don't go in there and say, oh, this is what it means, and it means this, and, 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 and you give this account that is explanatory. Mm -mm. You will get wrung out of the room. You know, the, the Zen teacher has a bell. Oh, is that what it is? It's, they, they, that means the show is over? <laughs> the style of the teacher ring you out. Yeah. And so you have to, there are other ways of presenting. You know, you might, you might, um, you know, depending on the koan, maybe you'll become a flower. Maybe you will brush your teeth. Mm -hmm. uh, Maybe you will um, become a goat. Mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe you'll take a sip of tea. You know, it, it just depends. But here's the thing. 
Zen understanding is embodied. And it's and what koans do is they help cultivate non-dual consciousness, non-dual experience. And so, you know, often at first, people just feel like they're acting Mm -hmm. because they're not, they don't have a a, a true sort of um, non-dual experience and, and, and their understanding isn't completely embodied. Right. But eventually, you know, the koans do their work by allowing us to ripen our non-dual understanding, our non-dual experience. And that has to be demonstrated to the teacher. Yes. Yeah. In a very embodied way. Yes. Are there are there um koans that are used like for different practices, maybe for uh, maybe you want to bring somebody into a deeper awareness of some aspect of themselves versus because a lot of the stories I've read about the use of koans are to facilitate enlightenment or awakening. Um, are there any examples you can give of different applications for and 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 what would be an example of a koan that would be intended to trigger an enlightenment experience? Well, well, all of them are, 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 you know, are capable of that. It just depends on, you know, where the practitioner is at a particular point in their life. But different koans sort of help us realize different aspects of our life. And they can be, again, particularly effective when they, um, when they allow us to see something that we're shutting off, that we're closed to. And, um, you know, my teacher, Jikyo Roshi, sometimes would talk about koans as as sort of like magnets. And they're magnets that sort of pull up for us uh, what we are saying no to, Mm -hmm. what we don't want to include in our lives. So like, you know, that dried shit stick. Yes. Who wants to include a shit stick? You know, who wants to say, what is my life? A dried shit stick. Yeah. Nobody. Yes. Nobody. And, you know, maybe that monk got something out of it. Maybe not. It depends on if he was, you know, if he was ripe or not. Yeah. You know, but they, but koans teach us different things different things you know there's a very short koan that i really like let's see if i have it here well i can remember it and uh actually let's let's do this one there's a wonderful koan called you know master ma is ill Mm. and this refers to master matsu who was a very illustrious chinese zen teacher chinese chan teacher And here's the whole koan, very short. So great master Ma was ill. The head monk came in and said, teacher, how is your health today? And master Ma said, sun-faced Buddha, moon-faced Buddha. Mm. Now it's a a wonderful koan. I should mention here that, you know, talking about koans as we are, it's that's different from koan practice where you have to go in and present something. So yeah, sure. we, can, we can talk about this one. And one of the things that's so beautiful about this koan is that, you know, here's a guy who's probably on death's door. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. But he probably has a preference. He'd he'd probably (laughs) prefer to feel better. Yeah. But what he realizes is that whether he is ailing and diminished and Mm moon-faced, that is equal to being radiant 
and in good health and being sun faced. Yes. The sun and the moon, they both are sources of light. Yes. So they're both, you know, it's about the awakened, the enlightened life. It seems to have a lot of um it draws one into an experience of equanimity. Yeah. When you when you when you really cultivate that as we call it, that side of equality or that even mind where, you know, whatever's happening included. All the opposites include them. Mm. Things that we have aversion to include them, include them, include them. You know, one of a very famous book of koans, it's called the Book of Equanimity. Oh, is it? Really cool. Yeah. And e if you ever notice, the word equanimity is related to the word equal. When you are able to accept everything equally, whatever's happening, whatever's happening. There is equanimity that's cultivated there. To me, equanimity means not getting blown out of your center. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that can be that can be a part of it. Yeah. And the center can be moving too. Yeah, true. <laughs> but that's a, you know another topic. But here, let me let me tell you another call. This is one of my very favorites. Okay. And this one's about. Uh, something that Master Xiang Yan said, again, another illustrious uh, Zen master. And he said, it is like being, it is like a man being up in a tree, hanging onto a branch by his teeth, <laughs> with his hands and feet not touching the tree branches at all. And beneath the tree, there's someone who asks about the meaning of Bodhidharma coming from the West. If this man does not reply, he is evading the questioner's question. If he does reply, <laughs> he perishes. Yeah. At such a moment, how could he answer? <laughs> it's, it's a wonderful poem because think of your own life. Yeah. Have you ever been in a situation that's analogous to being stuck up in a tree with nothing to hold on to? Yeah, I've been bankrupt. All, <laughs> yeah, and you've got all these people, like you said, wanting something from you, yeah. right? Yeah. So what do you do? What do you do? <laughs> you do the next thing. <laughs> can, yeah. can you learn to, to be there? Yeah. Again. It's a lesson I don't want to have to learn again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. One of the things I wanted to ask you is because most references to Zen and even the pictures of Zen almost always show people sitting with rigid, upright postures and a seated meditation. So um, tell us about the different types of meditation that Zen uses you did mention, which surprised me earlier, walking meditation, which I thought, well, that was great to hear. But I've often I've read a number of books where where people are talking about being on Zen meditation retreats and their legs are going numb, their spine is killing them, but they won't get up, and and you know e even people potentially getting injured doing that. Yeah, and, and then that shouldn't happen. Yeah, and then then also when you talk about that maybe you can tell us what is the purpose of the zen teacher's stick okay um, sure. and and because i like i said some i've read some stories of masters pushing people through extreme pain and they often talk about how they had to go through the pain to reach an enlightenment experience but i've, I've actually met people that went to zen meditations and ended up having compression of their sciatic nerve and ended up with permanent damage and things like that but they admitted it it was probably their own fault because they were trying to stick it out you know and i think that's the human factor and i don't know if that's the master's fault but i think that's just sort of typical people but maybe if you could just share us a little bit about these aspects of zen because i honestly think most people really because of so many pictures and books and magazines it's always a 
master standing there with his stick or his, what, what I always thought was called a bow. And then people sitting in these upright postures looking like they don't dare move for fear of getting whacked. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, every Zen teacher has, has his or her own style. And some of them have a very martial style. But it's, it's not without purpose. But, uh, you know, starting with the posture, um, you know, I, I think a lot of us encourage people to, you know, respect the natural curvature of the spine. Don't try to sit ramrod straight because that's probably not good for you. But we try to, we try to sit as straight as is um, possible without sort of going against our, our without natural, forcing it natural curvature and um there's a certain way we hold our hands and that there's an energetic story around that like we put the left hand over the you know the left palm over the right palm because that's supposed to be that's like yin over yang and and that's supposed to be settling for okay us. yeah and, you know, we often sit on cushions. Some people easily sit full lotus or Burmese style. Or at this, at this point in my life, I just, I sit on a chair. Oh, great. Because, yeah, because I spent about like 25 years in some form of cross-legged and then another 10 years on a meditation bench. And, you know, one of them put too much pressure on my ankles. The other one put too much pressure on my knees. And so at this point, I sit in a chair because it's, I'm, I'm not interested in, in injuring myself. Now, Zen is, it's a discipline, but it's not asceticism. You know, it's not about trying to do things that, you know, sort of torture the body so that we can get over our, our need for comfort or anything like that. But it is a discipline. So it is important to, to learn how to sit still, to uh, sit through periods of discomfort, and, you know, whether it's, you know, some kind of aching or you know, tickling of your skin or an ant crawling up your, I've had ants crawl around the room of my glasses before, <laughs> brings that a meditation retreat. And it is, it's, it's it's very good discipline because you're sitting there and you're you've made the vow to be awake, to be awake to your life as it's unfolding, and to not run away from that at the first sign of discomfort. Hi everybody, I'm super excited to share Bioptimizer's new excellent sleep support product called Sleep Breakthrough. I've used it and my kids use it and it's really good. It helps me sleep. It tastes great. And since it's a new product, I've got Matt here from Bioptimizers, who's one of the co-creators of the product, to give us some more information on how and why it works so well. So Matt, how does it work so well? Yeah, first of all, Sleep Breakthrough is a drink. You mix it about an hour before your target bedtime. You're going to feel your nervous system and your brain calm down. Your sleep latency will drop. Your desire to fall asleep will improve. Your REM is going to improve. Your heart rate will slow down and you're going to wake up feeling awesome. The way it works is we're targeting five different pathways. The first one is we want to optimize your natural melatonin production. We do that by giving your body the building blocks that it needs. The first one is magnesium bisglycinate. It's been shown to naturally increase melatonin levels. Then we add cofactors like P5P, which is a bioactive form of vitamin B6. Second, we have four different sleep minerals that will all improve the quality of your night's sleep. First is potassium, helps quiet down neurons. Second, calcium, which improves REM and also helps transform tryptophan into serotonin, which is a building block for melatonin. Third is zinc, which is really important for the metabolism of melatonin, again, it's a cofactor. And it also calms down the nervous system. And then last, again, is the magnesium bisglycinate. The third pathway is GABA, which is the molecule of chill. When they looked at insomniacs, they found that insomniacs were about 30% lower in GABA than people without sleep disorders. We tested pretty much every GABA on the market. We found that pharma GABA was the most powerful. The fourth pathway is they were targeting the brain. 
we're targeting brain waves. There's two molecules we can use to increase alpha brain waves and decrease beta brain waves, which is when people are struggling to fall asleep, the monkey brain's active, the hamster wheel's going, is because they have too many beta brain waves going. L theanine and pharma GABA increase alpha brain waves. And the last thing is glycine. Using three grams of glycine, which helps lower body temperature, it promotes faster sleep onset, extends REM. And my favorite part about it is if there's a night where you don't get enough sleep, you'll actually wake up feeling better and more refreshed the next day. That's awesome. Sounds like you did a lot of research to put a real beautiful combination of synergistic supplements and ingredients together to really help people sleep. I know it works very well. And I know one of the things that's lovely is my kids love it because it tastes great. Mm -hmm. And we all need more sleep, especially in the buzz of the world today. So if you want to get your sleep breakthrough, go to sleepbreakthrough.com forward slash C-H-E-K in lowercase. And to get your 10% discount on your sleep breakthrough, use the code capital P, capital A, capital U, capital L, 10. That's Paul 10 on checkout. Enjoy sleeping much better with Sleep Breakthrough. Now, I, I know that some Zen teachers um, do really push their students and they sit like 14 hours during the retreat. And, um, you know, these are some famous teachers and uh, I assume their students are are um, uh, realizing something. But, you know, I come from a lineage where we're encouraged to take care of ourselves. We want to sit still, but if we think we're injuring ourselves, we should adjust our posture or switch to a chair or switch to a different position. So. Um, yeah, yeah. Sometimes there can be again a real, uh, a real martial style that is pushing, pushing, pushing people to their limits. It really varies. It really varies among Zen teachers and practice centers and lineages. How much is seated versus lying down? Dynamic movement, walking meditations. How 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 uh, much variation is there? Okay, um, I think in, in many places the the emphasis is on seated meditation, but it doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be. Um, and as I was mentioning to you before, really, you know, sort of the the ideal in Zen is that every activity that we're engaged in, whether it's farming, uh, whether it's um, you know, again, typical chopping wood or cooking the meals or doing the shopping. These are all opportunities to be awake. Um, but there are, but we do sitting meditation or we do walking meditation between every sitting period. So basically every half an hour, we do 10 minutes of walking meditation. Oh, that's fantastic. Oh, yeah. Every, every, uh, every half an hour. And then again, we do our work practice. We do our cooking. You know, we, do, uh, we have breaks where we encourage body practice. So a lot, like in, in my group, there are a number of people who like to do yoga or tai chi or something else, just um, stretching, Feldenkrais, something like that. Um, on several of my trips to China, you know, I'm very curious as to, you know, how Chan or Zen is being practiced in China. And in some places, they're, um, they do a chanting practice. And they'll chant the name of the Buddha. And they'll do it for hours. And, they, and often they'll do it walking. You know, and they might have, you know, some, uh, some beads, um, you know, a mala where they're using that to, you know, uh, to keep track of the, the chanting of the names of the Buddha. But then what they'll do is they'll add something very koan-like. 
you know, uh, what they call a Watto, which is a critical uh, phrase. And so they'll, they'll have been chanting, chanting, chanting the name of the Buddha. And then they'll throw in there a question. Who is chanting the name of the Buddha? Who is chanting the name of the Buddha? So it's like a combination of koan and a walking and a chanting uh, practice. I like that. Um, I'm really glad I asked you that question because I think a lot of people have this understanding just because there there is so much literature out there that really talks about the seated practice. And there's a lot of discussion I've seen in many magazines, for example, on spiritual development, where the conversations about, you know, the discipline it takes, how hard it is, how long you have to sit. And so I think some people, probably a lot of people have a perception of Zen, almost like some kind of martial arts training where you really got to learn to toughen up and endure a lot of pain. And um, I think if a person needs that, it's one thing, but I also think that for most people today, it's going to exclude a lot of people because they're, they're going to go for one session like that. And they're going, I'm never going to do that again. And, And so I love what you're sharing as the approach that you're taking, because I, I think it's, for me, it's important that people get involved in, in spiritual practices. I think it's very important due to the situation the world is in and that, uh, I, I love Zen because of it, it, of the non grasping aspect, the sort of open endedness of it. Um, you know, like I said, it's like a greased pig. It's you, you can't go beat somebody up with your Zen philosophy if you really understand what you're doing, because then you're not doing it right. And and but you see all the you know the constant religious bashing going on, meaning this religion versus that religion and and so I love what you're sharing. Um, we're getting close to the end, and, and I've got an important question. Oh, did you want to know about the stick? Oh, yes, please, yes. Okay, so there, there are several kinds of stick, but I think the kind of stick you're talking about is what they call in uh, Japanese the kiyosaku. And it's a, it's, a, it's a stick that can be used to hit people. Now, what that is about is this. It's not punitive. It's not a punishment. What happens is when you sit for a long time in meditation is these muscles uh, uh, up here, the shoulder, the neck muscles, they get very tight. And uh, a person who is wielding the kiyosaku, the stick, is well-trained. Uh-huh. I do. So they, they don't hurt know, people. <laughs> they don't hurt. They know just how and where and what angle to hit you so that it helps those muscles relax. Yeah, that's good. Um, you know, I really like the stick, but we don't use it anymore. A, a long time ago, a person that I was practicing with actually was having, um, you know, kind of bad flashbacks from an abusive childhood. Yeah, I can see that. And yeah. so we just we just don't use the stick anymore. Yeah. yeah. But it's not meant for punishment. You know, you'll see in the in the Japanese um uh monasteries uh, or practice centers the, the monks kind of walking around like they're on patrol and it can look pretty nasty. That's that's partly to to you know, keep you aware, aware of your posture, aware of whether you're dozing off or not. And then people have the opportunity to ask, you know, there are certain signals you can make to ask for the stick. And so it's always wielded with a, with the uh, idea of helping, helping the practitioner. Cool. Uh, I think that's a great thing for everybody to understand because one of the, that's one of the things that's kind of mysterious. So people start filling the blanks in themselves. Yeah. And there it was, could you know, scare them away from Zen. There, you know, there's a period in Zen history where these shock tactics were used a lot. And that's, you know, that has to be understood in its context. The, you know, the, this is a particularly brutal time in 
Chinese history and Buddhists being persecuted and so on. And, you know, it might have been helpful for people to yeah, be could've. exposed to those kinds of tactics. Yeah. Sure. This is sort of like the 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 um, closing bell for our podcast today. As a Zen Roshi, if you could offer some advice to help people deal with all the chaos and insecurity we're experiencing in the world today due to issues such as government, medical, political tyranny, uncertainty in the banking and financial systems, mixed messages regarding global warming, and more, what can you share from your Zen training, your Zen life, your Zen perspective that would be practical that anybody could understand and possibly apply? Okay, let me let me try. First of all, you know, we don't talk much about faith in Zen, but there is a big role for faith. And I would I would encourage people to have faith that your life lacks nothing. Oh. It's complete just as it is. You might not see that, but you will. So it's about having faith that your life is the way. Your life is the Buddha way. So that's something. Now, something more embodied is if you find yourself kind of overwhelmed in any particular situation, find your feet. Uh -huh. yeah. Take your awareness down to your feet and really feel them. And really feel the ground beneath your feet. So get your shoes off. You can. You might be like I. I was walking out of Trader Joe's a couple of weeks ago, and it was so chaotic right out in the front that I just found my feet, and I'm like, oh, okay, here I am. You know, the next thing I'll do is take a step in in this direction or that direction. So it's 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 not about grounding, although it's great if you can take your shoes off and go to the beach and all that. But if you're in the middle of something intense, find your feet. Because what can happen is it can take you out of that big spin cycle that is your mind and ground you in something that's present. You know, so find your feet or find your your breath really, really important to, to be able to ground yourself in your body. And instead of getting lost in all these stories and, and, and various other thoughts. Um, something else I would encourage people to do is to, again, practice seeing things as, as equal Okay, practice that mind of equality. And this can be a really challenging thing. You know, we're so polarized politically. And in and also in of course in many, many other ways. But one thing that you can practice um, is something that you can this is very koan like. But you can use your imagination to, you know, to to become, say, some person that you admire, somebody you have no problem with. And you can do that. You really feel your way into this person with your whole, with your whole body and your imagination. But then take a person that you have real, real trouble with. And your example of Klaus Schwab. Can you become Klaus Schwab? Can you take your imagination and really feel your way into Klaus Schwab? Can you really experience oneness with Klaus Schwab? Mm -hmm. Now, I want to be careful here. This is not a practice that is meant to make you suddenly agree with anything that, that, that someone says, but it, it can help you to it can help you to open to, to something or someone you're saying no to. I remember during a presidential election years ago, there was a certain candidate I couldn't open to, just couldn't stand the side of the person. So I would practice becoming 
both of the candidates, one after another, one after another. Didn't make me, you know, like the views of any of the candidates any better, but I could open to them. I could acknowledge them. So some people might want to practice mm, being a progressive than being a MAGA person or being a libertarian and then being a socialist or a communist. You know, this might be a little too weird for people, but I think it can be very I think it's important. It's, you know, it, it's... I'm trying to find the right words. It's, you know, it's kind of like when, when I was a kid in school, we would have debate cl classes that would be part of our training. And we had to choose the side of a debate. And then we had to get on the other side of the table and be just as committed. Even if we didn't agree with it, we had to embody that opposite. And, and I've done this with Klaus Schwab, exactly what you've just described. I've done it with Bill Gates. Mm -hmm. um, and what I found, what 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 happened inside of me is I I I had the visceral sense that wow these guys really truly believe that they're doing the right thing, like they have as much faith in what their their view of life and the world as Jesus had in his. I mean, metaphorically, of course. Yeah, and when, yeah, so when we do that, we often discover. That you know what ex what it is that really bothers us so much about these people is something that actually we carry within us. You know, this can be a, kind of a form of shadow work. It is, yes, one version of shadow. And we can also recognize that in the right amount, in the right place, under the right circumstances, some of that some of that quality is exactly what's needed. Exactly what's needed. And we and it's it's in our it belongs to our range. We embody it too. We embody it too. Well, you know, and it's been great to dialogue with you on all these things because um you've helped me get a deeper perspective of Buddhism than I had. And uh, you know, the questions that I wrote up were often questions that I personally wanted to get answers to because well, it's one thing to read books. It's another thing to talk to someone who's really put their life into it like you have and, and is a real Zen teacher. So, you, you know, reading a book, you can't ask the book a question. You have to just take what's in print. So I was excited to be able to explore this and take everybody on the journey with us because I think today it's really important to have a good menu for the options for the ways we can either grow spiritually or learn better self-management strategies or learn ways to manage our mind more effectively. Um, I don't think it's a good time in the world to be passive about growing your adult awareness because we have a lot of adult situations going on in the world that require adult participation and because one of the hallmarks of a legitimate spiritual practice of any kind is growing up and i think for me it's important as an educator podcast host to help people have exposure to people like yourself so they can say oh that's not for me or wow that sounds like something i could really get into or at least it's worth checking out and uh, that brings up another question do you do any online work with people or is it strictly in your studio well at this point you know we gave up our uh our our physical uh, location when COVID hit. You know, there's no sense in a small sangha paying rent, you know, when we can't be there. So at this moment, our sangha, our, our Zen community is online. You know, we're going to do a, a retreat in January and we're going to, we're going to rent an Airbnb so that we can be together in person for that. Oh, good. That's great. 
But yeah, these days I mostly work with people online. This, the Sangha gets together on Tuesday nights and Thursday nights. I have a Dharma brother who teaches on Thursday nights, and he's a wonderful teacher. And um, yeah, so we're online. We're the Vista Zen Center. Okay, the Vista Zen Center. Is it Vista, the VistaZenCenter.com? Or? Yeah, it's VistaZenCenter.com. VistaZenCenter.com. How much does it cost? How how does it work? Do you pay a certain amount for a like months or sessions or how does it work? The way it works is with with just our usual weekly program. If somebody wants to become a member, and we give people a grace period because they might decide it's not for them, you know. But if you decide you want to show up and show up regularly, um, we have ridiculously cheap monthly dues are like, I think it's like $35 or maybe $40 a month. Okay. I should have checked that, but I, you know, I don't think we've raised our, our, our membership dues. And then for retreats, um, that's usually about $40 a day. Oh, that's pretty reasonable. That oh, includes so, food. Yeah. And that includes food. You guys eating rice cakes all day? No, I, often people volu- uh, kind of donate food and, and you know, because we do all the cooking and everything. Oh, and- right. Yes, that's right. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. So it's part of the experience. It's pretty cheaply. These are at retreats or where where, where do you do them at? Like um, like uh, outdoor retreats or eco villages or? Well, at, we, we did have our own center for years. So we did it at a, at a house in Vista. But uh, now... Um, we're going to do an Airbnb for our January retreat. Um, and so it'll be, you know, eventually we'd like to have a, a, a stable location again. Yeah. Um, but we haven't found one. You know, San Diego is very expensive, as you know. We're a, a, a small sangha. Um, my time is completely volunteered. Um, and so uh, hopefully we can find something where we could, you know, meet for our weekly meetings and also do our retreats four or five times a year. That would be awesome. But we we don't have that right now. No, I'm not a big fundraiser. And, I, you know, I, I, I teach philosophy full time for a living. Oh, I was going to ask you, are you still teaching philosophy? Yeah. Yeah. Where do you do that? I do that at, at uh, the University of San Diego. Oh, cool. That's exciting. I love philosophy. And there, this is my thirty-first year there. Wow! Yeah. At yeah. UCSD? No, it's USD. Oh, USD. Okay. Mm-hmm. That's it's cool. A wonderful school. It really is, and I have wonderful students there. That's fantastic. Well, and thank you for sharing with us and taking us on this Zen journey. Um, I think it's really a great opportunity for us to have the exploration, like I said, and um, just give us the URL, the Vista Zen Center, or is it just Vista Zen Center? Yeah, it's just vistazencenter.com. And if if I can give you one more. Sure. Because people might be looking for, for teachers in different parts of the, the world and the country. Um, the, I, I belong to a lineage, and there's an affinity group. And there's a website that is whiteplum.org. And so if someone is looking for a Zen teacher, they might go to whiteplum.org and check it out. See if there's a a teacher in their area. Um, And that's a place to start looking for a teacher. But, you know, they should check. San Francisco Zen Center. They have a you know a wonderful lineage there, and and ask around, ask around. Great. Well, thank you very much, Anne. I really enjoyed it. Well, I did too. I really enjoyed talking with you, Paul. And I think you're doing a wonderful service. You're really offering something of value with your podcasts. I do my best. Um, you know, I. I don't want to be in the category of just yakety yak about nothingness. I think, you know, I, I believe people's time is valuable, but I also really feel podcasts can be a very 
important learning tool because you can do it while you're driving, gardening, cooking, cleaning, lifting weights, running. And so I think podcasting is really sort of like such a portable way to learn and grow and and explore that uh, my dream for my podcast was always to give people something that adds value and expands their awareness and gives them new concepts, tools, ways of understanding and perspectives. Even if they don't agree with it, I think it's important to see how other people see the world. And so I, I love having people like you that can give us a different perspective on how we can live and, and even think about our life or not think about it, you know, um, in a productive way, not not thinking about it to cop out, but not thinking about it so that we don't think ourselves to death about it. <laughs> so thank you very much. And thank you to the sponsors for all your love and support and your amazing products and your sustainable practices. Thank you to all of you that buy anything from the sponsors. A little bit goes to the podcast to support the podcast. And I hope you enjoyed uh, our time with Anne today and learning about Zen. And I would encourage you to check Anne's website out and maybe join her and see what happens when you spend time with her every week for a while. And um, I think you probably find that she's an amazing and beautiful woman and that she could probably really help grow you into something more amazing and feel greater about yourself. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Paul. You're welcome. Thank you for listening to Living 4D with Paul Check and today's guest, Anne Piruccello. If you are interested in learning more about the traditional and modern Zen techniques, visit vistazencenter.com. That's V-I-S-T-A-Z-E-N-C-E-N-T-E-R.com. You can also follow Anne on Instagram at boysalizbeth, that's B-O-Z-A-L-I-S-B-E-T-H, or email her at amster at gmail.com. That's A-N-N-P-S-T-E-R at gmail.com. You can also see her photography at surfphotolahoya.com. That's surfphotolahoya.com. You can find Paul on Instagram and TikTok at paul.check, on Twitter at paulcheck, or on his YouTube podcast channel, youtube.com forward slash living 4 d with Paul Check. You can watch more on Paul's blog at paulchecksblog.com or visit the Czech Institute site at checkinstitute.com to find Paul's e-learning courses, advanced training programs, and to learn more about the Czech Academy. You can read the show notes and find links to the resources mentioned in this episode at checkinstitute.com forward slash podcast. And if you enjoyed today's episode, please consider leaving us a five-star rating and a warm review at the top of the show page on Spotify or at the bottom of the show page if you are listening on Apple Podcast.